the Bible to the cross from the cross. Every Bible story has three components. First, God's love. Second, God's compassion. Third, God's miracle. Opening your Bible opens miracles. The Bible as one story is holy enough in our lives. Day 274, Ezra 7 to 8. Ezra's establishment of the Sanhedrin Assembly. Ezra, who decided to study the laws of God, practice them, and teach the people, returned to Jerusalem, harboring this mission in his mind. First point Ezra, who was a scholar in the laws of Moses and an official of the Persian Empire, returned to Jerusalem with the second group of captives in 458 BC. Jerubbabel was the leader of the first return of the captives, and then Ezra became the leader of the second group. Ezra was a scholar in the laws of Moses, a priest, and also an official of the Persian Empire. Ezra noticed that the king had granted him all that he had asked for. It appears that Ezra was a teacher to the king or some kind of a high-ranking official. Ezra was well versed in the laws of Moses, and his supporter was the king Artaxerxes. Although Ezra was a captive, he was the descendant of the high priest, and therefore a priest himself. Due to the Persian Empire's policy of regional decentralization, the first group of captives had already returned, and now the second group was to return. Similar to the first time round, Ezra and the second group of people also set off from Babylon. Later on, Nehemiah took the third group from Mount Susa to Jerusalem. The reason Ezra decided to return to Jerusalem, which remained a desolate place, was because he had devoted himself to the study and observance of the law of God and to teaching its decrees and laws in Israel. Second point, Artaxerxes, who wished to gain good results through his regional decentralization policy, sent Ezra to the region of Levant. The king of Persia sent Ezra and the second group of captives to Levant in order to succeed in his regional decentralization policy. Artaxerxes also released an edict. The reasons the king sent Ezra was first in order to investigate the political and religious circumstances of South Judah. The second was in order to systematize the laws in the west of the Euphrates River. The third was in order to succeed the regional decentralization policy in the Levant area. The king provided generous funds for Ezra to make offerings to God in the Jerusalem temple. In order for everything to learn smoothly, Artaxerxes issued another edict to ensure that all funds would be provided. This was the fulfillment of God's words to Isaiah. Artaxerxes excused the people who worked in the Jerusalem temple from paying tax to Persia. He also provided Ezra with the necessary funds and the tools to make sure that it was safe in the west of Euphrates River. Ezra had the right to establish laws, teach them, and also to judge the people. Third point, Ezra established the Sanhedrin Assembly, which became an important assembly for the Jews. With Assyria conquering North Israel and Babylon conquering South Judah, Israel was no longer able to maintain their monarchical system. On the other hand, the Persian Empire allowed the Jews to keep independent council around Ezra, and the result of this was the Sanhedrin Assembly. The Sanhedrin Assembly enabled Ezra to carry out legal judgment. This was supported by King Artaxerxes and was made possible through Ezra. And even after the fall of the Persian Empire, this assembly was maintained. Fourth point, Ezra looked for the Levites for the second return of captives and also prepared while fasting. 
In order to prepare for the second return of the captives, Ezra firstly checked the list of the people who were to return, and this was done according to families. He secondly searched for the Levites. When he found out that only 341 Levites returned during the first round and that there were none during the second round, he quickly searched for them. Before heading back, Ezra proclaimed a gathering of the people to fast together. Ezra did not seek help from the king before going, but from God. Ezra was highly regarded by the king that the king did not hesitate to provide Ezra with a hundred pieces of silver on top of all the other materials. This meant that Ezra could simply have asked the king for military protection. But Ezra did not ask for this. He recorded that this would have brought him shame, as he had been the one to teach the king that God's protection was enough. He had every faith that God would help and protect them. Fifth point, similar to the first round of return of captives, Ezra also made an offering to God on behalf of all 12 tribes of Israel. Finally, the second round of return of captives to Jerusalem set off. Ezra gathered the people for three days in order to count and record them, spent a further nine days to search for the Levites and then headed for Jerusalem. It took approximately four months to reach Jerusalem. Once they arrived, Ezra and the people made the offering to God. There was no damage to their goods during their four months' travel, and so they offered it all. Similar to the first time round, Ezra also made an offering to God on behalf of all 12 tribes of Israel. After making the offering to God, Ezra handed over Artaxerxes' edict to the governor of the trans Euphrates to ask for help. Day 275, Ezra 9 to 10. Ezra's laws and the repentance movement. Beginning with the prey of Ezra, who accepted the sins of the nation as his own and repented. The foundation of reform based on God's covenants and laws was laid down. First point, when Ezra saw that the returned captives priests and the Levites married the foreign women, he expressed devastation. The leaders from the second group of returned captives came to Ezra and reported the sins of the priests and the Levites. They reported that the priests and Levites did not separate themselves from foreign women. Very early on, God had told through Moses, for the people to separate themselves with their foreign neighbors. But Solomon and Ahab representatively disobeyed this law, and now the people started to disobey it. When Ezra heard this, he was unable to hide his devastation. Ezra tore his robes, shaved off his hair and beard, and expressed utter devastation towards these people. Ezra had the heart of God when he tore his robes. When those who sinned heard this, they came to Ezra in great fear. Second point, Ezra reflected on God's punishment through Israel's history and started a repentance movement. Ezra started to pray for the people as they had intermarried with the foreign women. Ezra confessed the sins of the people. Ezra confessed the nation's sins to God and repented on their behalf. Ezra claimed that their sins were great and that they repented. Ezra then prayed to the merciful God to thank him. Ezra said in his prayer that God had delivered the people from captivity with his great mercy, but they had once again sinned before him. Although it was too embarrassing even to ask for forgiveness again, Ezra nonetheless asked for forgiveness and proclaimed that the people repented before him. Third point, Ezra pressed 
reset for a kingdom of a priestess through the foundation of the Jerubbabel Temple. Ezra continued his prayer and he referred to God's laws in order to repent on behalf of the people. Ezra claimed that God was righteous, but humans were unrighteous, and thus they needed God's great mercy. Ezra prayed for the people as Daniel had prayed for his people in the past. This was also continued by Nehemiah, who also prayed for his people. Ezra's prayer gave the people a new start to become good figs in the kingdom of priests. To the people that gathered, Ezra told them to repent. As such, the foundation of Jerubbabel's temple and Ezra's prayer meant that the kingdom of priests was able to become implemented once again. Although the physical restoration of the temple had been implemented, the contents inside were yet to be started. Now the 16th descendant of Aaron, Ezra, hit the reset button and turned the people before God. The people were able to move one step towards being holy citizens in the kingdom of priests. Fourth point, through the rights given to him by the Persian king, Ezra assembled all the people for three days. The returned captives repented before God. Here, Shekaniah, who was the son of Jehiel, swore to help Ezra. He promised to part from the foreign women and to live by the law. He furthermore promised to do his best to help Ezra carry out the religious reformation. Ezra told the people to all gather, and if they did not come within three days, they would be excluded from the community. This was only possible as the king had given him the rights. After this notice, all the people assembled and they feared to stand in front of Ezra. Fifth point, Ezra's reformation for a kingdom of priests so its result in three days. The returned captives assembled within three days and decided to obey Ezra's reformation for a kingdom of priests. Ezra told the people to repent and to split from their foreign women, but a group of people said that they needed time before sending away their foreign wives. At this, Jonathan and Jazeah stood out to say, that they would immediately split from their foreign wives. It was decided that within three months, all would split from their foreign wives, and this was all checked and recorded. As such, within the next three months, 112 foreign women were all sent back, and the people were restored to their faith. Day 276, Nehemiah 1-3 Intermediate goals for the final goal Nehemiah, who inquired about the condition of Jerusalem, prayed to God and set intermediate goals to achieve his final goal of reconstructing the desolate Jerusalem walls. First point, both Jeremiah and Nehemiah recorded the names of their fathers in their books. Jeremiah wrote down the name of his father in his book to introduce himself. 150 years later, Nehemiah also recorded the name of his father in his book. The similarity between Jeremiah and Nehemiah was that they both learned about the kingdom of priests from their parents from a young age. We can see how faith education from a young age can change the course of history. Nehemiah's forefathers were born as captives in Babylon, and he learned about the kingdom of priests through his father. Whilst living in Persia, Nehemiah found out about the current affairs of Jerusalem. The state of Jerusalem had not changed much compared with 150 years ago. On top of that, they were experiencing interruptions from the Samaritans. Second point, Nehemiah's prayer contained 
a thousand years in time, starting from Leviticus chapter 26. When Nehemiah heard the current affairs of Jerusalem, he started to fast and prayed to God. Nehemiah's prayer was five sentences long, but in those sentences, he included the content of Leviticus chapter 26 and Deuteronomy that asked God to govern over them through a kingdom of priests. Nehemiah firstly prayed to the merciful God. Nehemiah also confessed the sins of the people and repented. Indeed, he was well versed in the laws and the Pentateuch. Nehemiah relied totally on God and prayed with total faith. In his prayer, Nehemiah confessed that the Jews were God's people. Nehemiah asked God to hear his prayer and grant his request. Third point, after Esther, Nehemiah also negotiated with a Persian king. In between the first and second round of captivity, Esther had succeeded in making the Persian king change his edict in order to save the Jews. Extending from this, Nehemiah also asked the Persian king to issue an edict so that he could become the governor of Judea. This happened four months after Nehemiah heard about his people and since praying to God. Nehemiah told the king why he looked sad. Nehemiah was afraid because the king could have thought that Nehemiah was trying to kill him, so he immediately explained why he had sadness in his face. He explained that he was worried about Jerusalem, where his ancestors were buried. Nehemiah therefore requested to be sent to his land as a governor. We can learn from the latter part that Nehemiah estimated a short time for the restoration of the city walls project. However, it took 12 years in total. During the 32nd year of King Artaxerxes' rule, Nehemiah returned to Persia and then was sent to Jerusalem again. Nehemiah requested the king to issue an edict to return to Jerusalem and to carry out his project, and the king immediately said yes. King Artaxerxes enabled Nehemiah to become the governor of Jerusalem to pass through the Trans-Euphrates River area, to freely use the materials required for the reconstruction of the city walls, and to use soldiers and workers from Persia. The fact that the king offered his soldiers and workers was indeed the biggest privilege. This was all possible due to the fact that the king respected and trusted Nehemiah fully. First point, after three days of looking around Jerusalem, he explained to the leaders of Jerusalem why he had come. After the 70 years of captivity in Babylon, the return to Jerusalem was carried out in three stages. The first was led by Jerubbabel, and then 80 years later, the second group was led by Ezra, and then 14 years later, the third group was led by Nehemiah. The reason the Persian Empire enabled such talented people to go to Jerusalem was because they had not yet seen good results from the regional decentralization policy in the area of Levant. Unlike the second round of return of the captives, where Ezra did not ask for any military protection. Nehemiah requested protection, which made the people of Samaria anxious. Whereas the second return took four months, the third return took only three months. After looking around Jerusalem for three days, he announced to the leaders why he had come. Nehemiah saw that Jerusalem had become so desolate, that while the animals were able to come in and out as they pleased, and without the city walls, everything was exposed. Nehemiah announced to the people that they would no longer endure this state. Fifth point, 
Nehemiah recorded the names of the people who worked relentlessly with him to restore the city walls. Despite some interruptions, Nehemiah still went forth to build the city walls. Nehemiah recorded the names of the precious people who worked relentlessly with him to carry out this project. Nehemiah recorded each step of the process, starting from the gates and so on. Instead of focusing the record on himself, he wrote the names of the people that helped him and were with him. The reconstruction of the city walls meant that the people were protected from outside invasion. They were also able to prevent wild animals from entering. Nehemiah carried out this task beautifully. Day 277, Nehemiah 4-7, Nehemiah's 52 days. Thanks to the leadership of Nehemiah, who changed a crisis into opportunity, and the effort of the people who labored together, eventually rebuilding the wall of Jerusalem was completed. First point, not long after starting the project to reconstruct the walls of Jerusalem, Nehemiah faced difficulties. Not long after starting the project to reconstruct the Jerusalem walls, Sambalat's men started to interfere. When Nehemiah's people went ahead with the project, despite the interruptions, they became very angry and started insulting them. Nevertheless, Nehemiah continued on and prayed to God for help. This really fumed Sambalas men, and they started to plot against them. Nehemiah prayed all the more and asked God to help him guard his mouth. However, although this did not shake Nehemiah, the people who were with him were inevitably troubled. The people became divided into three categories. The first group claimed that they would not be able to finish reconstructing the walls. The second group feared that they would be attacked, and the third group suggested stopping the construction and to fight against Sambalas men. When things started to get out of hand, Nehemiah had to take this into his own hands. First, Nehemiah decided that this project would not be postponed, and so the people would hold tools in one hand to work and weapons in the other to protect themselves. Second, Nehemiah encouraged the people that God would be with them, so they need not fear. And so the people were able to continue their task. Second point, Nehemiah pointed out that the holy citizens in the kingdom of priests were never to deal in real estate or sell people for money. Whilst Nehemiah was dealing with the external issues with the Sambalot, internal problems occurred. This was none other than the outcry of the Jews. They cried out that they were lacking in grains, that famine was taking its toll, that Persia's tax rate was too high, and that their children were being sold as slaves. This was indeed something that the holy citizens in the kingdom of priests were most certainly forbidden from doing. The laws in the kingdom of priests forbade both land and human sales. Another problem within the community of returned captives was that they did not look after their neighbors. When Nehemiah heard all this, he assembled the people and publicly rebuked them. He furthermore preferred some outlines and suggestions to solve these issues. Nehemiah summoned the priests and made the nobles and officials take an oath to do all that they had promised. The first was to decline payment of future interest. The second was to send back what was not theirs. And the third was to return the interest they had received so far. Third point. During the 12 years Nehemiah was governor, he did not receive any bribes for his work. 
and fed 150 people every day in his house. Nehemiah had outstanding leadership skills as well as a devoted attitude. First, he did not receive bribes for his work as governor. Second, he did not take from the people as other governors did. Nehemiah did not acquire any personal land and worked the same as his brothers. Furthermore, 150 Jews and officials ate at his table. If we look at the circumstances of the time, a famine had struck, and therefore grains and other types of foods were scarce. But during such a difficult time, Nehemiah offered his own food to the people and also declared that no one had to pay interest. As such, Nehemiah was an outstanding leader. Fourth point, Sambalas' man schemed, wrote threatening letters, and also sent false prophets to interrupt and prevent the Jerusalem walls from being reconstructed. The people of Sambalot made plans to kill Nehemiah in order to prevent the Jerusalem walls from being reconstructed. They concealed their intentions and called Nehemiah to the assembly four times. But as Nehemiah knew their intentions, he declined their offer. And so they sent Nehemiah a threatening letter. They told Nehemiah that there was a rumor spreading, that he was revolting against the Persian Empire, and that he was trying to become king of the Jews. They tried to lure him in by arranging a meeting and then planned to assassinate him. However, Nehemiah refused their offer once again. When Nehemiah did not cooperate, they brought in Shumea, the false prophet. This also did not work, and Nehemiah refused again. Despite all of this, Nehemiah pushed forth with his law and prayed to God all throughout. Fifth point, Nehemiah completed the Jerusalem wall reconstruction in 52 days and then established someone to be responsible for the management of the walls. After experiencing a great deal of difficulties, the Jerusalem walls were finally reconstructed. Indeed, it was astonishing that this whole project was completed within just 52 days. Despite how the people shed many tears and sweat, they confessed that it was all thanks to God. God had raised Nehemiah as the wine bearer of Arthur Jaxis in order to fulfill this. Thus, no one can interfere or change God's history or vision. However, God's vision requires the sweat and tears of humans. Although the walls were put up, this did not stop the enemies from invading and attacking. Before the walls were completed, it was no use closing the gates. As there were no gates, wild animals came in during the night, as well as enemies. This was the reason Nehemiah wished to carry out this project, to those who did not have the strength to build even their own houses. Nehemiah encouraged them to build the walls so that they would be protected. After completing this, Nehemiah recorded the names of the first return of captives in his book. Nehemiah recorded the leaders of the first group of captives and then recorded the people according to their families and regions. He also recorded the names of the priests. The record of the priests Nehemiah wrote was the same as those in Ezra chapter 2, which shows how precise the records were made by Nehemiah. The project for reconstructing the wall was not just Nehemiah's wish, but God's wish. God wished for his people to be protected and to be secure. Day 278 Nehemiah 8 to 10 Nehemiah and Ezra's Festival of Tanj. After the wall of Jerusalem was completely rebuilt, Ezra and Nehemiah joined the forces, gathered the people to hear the laws of Moses and kept the Feast of Tabernacle. 
First point, after the reconstruction of the Jerusalem walls, the people requested Ezra to educate them on the laws of Moses. Once the walls became reconstructed, the people requested Ezra to teach them the laws and Ezra started to educate them. Ezra taught the people about the word of God. What the people needed now was God's message. Ezra read aloud God's words to the people, and the Levites taught the people the laws. At the time, there would have been those who were unfamiliar with their mother language, and so both the Hebrew and Aram languages were used to teach them. When the people heard God's laws and words, they repented sincerely. The people all gathered to celebrate the Feast of Trumpets and enjoy the food and drink. Second point, Ezra and Nehemiah worked hard with the people to keep the festival. On the second day of the seventh month, the heads of all the families, along with the priests and the Levites, gathered around Ezra to give attention to the words of God. The people all came together, led by Ezra and Nehemiah, to celebrate and to fellowship. In particular, they kept the Feast of Tabernacle as well as the Feast of Trumpet, in order to study the laws in depth. They relived what their ancestors did in the desert for 40 years by dedicating their time in educating themselves about God's laws and commands. Third point, after the festival, the Levites led the people in the repentance movement. On the 24th day of the seventh month, the people started their repentance movement. The people came together and they fasted. They wore sackcloths and they put dust on their heads. They confessed their sins, and this was led by the Levites. Nehemiah recorded the names of these Levites. The people renewed their covenant with God and they all prayed to him. They revised the content from Genesis to Exodus. Then they revised the history in the desert after Exodus. They thanked God for all he did and counted everything the glorious God had granted them. They accepted that their ancestors did wrong, but that God was nevertheless merciful towards them. They then revised the content of the 500 years of monarchy. They then revised the history of the years of captivity and then repented. First point, the leaders of the returned captives swore that they would obey the laws in a kingdom of priests. The returned captives renewed their covenant with God led by Ezra and Nehemiah. The repentance movement of the returned captives led to such wonderful results. Nehemiah recorded the names of the people who turned to God. These were the names of the priests, Levites, and the leaders. They all swore to obey God's laws. Everyone promised to obey the laws and acknowledged the punishment they would receive otherwise as written in Deuteronomy chapter 28. Fifth point, the returned captives swore that they would keep the laws written in the book of Moses. The people swore an oath that they would keep the laws of Moses. They firstly swore that they would not intermarry with foreign women. They secondly swore that they would keep Sabbath, Sabbath career, and Jubilee. They thirdly swore that they would be responsible over the duties of the temple. They fourthly swore that they would offer the trees for the altar for offerings. They fifthly swore that they would present to God the first fruits and animals at the temple. They lastly swore that they would offer tithe so that the priests and Levites would be able to live. The Levites furthermore swore that the tithes they received would be checked with the priest, and that they would also offer their tithe from the tithes they received. As such, the feasts were a reminder 
of God's constant love for them. Day 279, Nehemiah 11 to 13, Nehemiah's final goal. The dedication ceremony for the rebuilt walls of Jerusalem was finally completed, and this brought back laughter to God and to people. First point, Nehemiah decided who was to live in Jerusalem by using the method of a casting lot which was used by Joshua during initial entrance into Canaan. When all the reconstruction work for the wall was completed, Nehemiah used the method used by Joshua all those years ago of casting lot to allocate land to the people. This was a continuation from the content in Nehemiah chapter 7. The reason Nehemiah chose this method was because even at the time, the Holy Jerusalem was still an extremely dangerous place. Thus, Nehemiah gathered those who had responsibilities, volunteers, and some others to live in Jerusalem. Three types of people were to live in Jerusalem. The first were the leaders of the people. The second were one-tenth of the people who were picked by the casting lot method. The third were those who volunteered to live in Jerusalem. Nehemiah made the record of all those who were picked and all those who volunteered to live in Jerusalem. Nehemiah also thoroughly recorded those among the tribe of Judah and Benjamin who were to live elsewhere from Jerusalem. As such, the people were split into those who lived inside and outside Jerusalem. But what they had in common was their determination to maintain a kingdom of priests. Second point, after settling everyone in their lands, Nehemiah went ahead and recorded the priests and the Levites who were to serve in the Jerusalem temple. Governor Nehemiah allocated everyone to their land and then recorded the priests and the Levites. He first recorded the priests and the Levites who returned during the first round. He then recorded the descendants of a high priest Joshua. Third, he recorded the ancestors of the priests. Fourth, he recorded the ancestors of the Levites. The meaning of Jerusalem was in the temple, and the temple's meaning was in the people who served God in the temple. It was important that this was continued by Moses, David, and Solomon, and that the Levites maintained their roles. Now that the temple was restored, and the walls were also reconstructed, it was important that all the priests and the Levites were recorded and checked. In order for Jerusalem to act as God's holy place, it was all the more important that the priests and Levites worked to carry out offerings to God. Thus, Nehemiah took this law of checking and recording them very seriously. He did not forget that the reason South Judah fell was at least partly because the priests and Levites had neglected their laws. Third point, the cry during the time of Jeremiah 150 years ago was changed to the sound of joy and laughter 150 years later during the time of Nehemiah. After 52 days of hard work, Nehemiah and his team managed to complete the reconstruction of the city walls. The reason the temple was not used immediately after it was restored was because the people living in Jerusalem at the time were few. It was here that Nehemiah went to find the Levites so that they could start serving in the temple again. In order to start using the temple again, the priests, Levites, and the people all gathered. Next, the two large choirs were assigned to give thanks. The two choirs that gave thanks then took their places in the house of God. At last, the temple was ready to be used. Now, Jerusalem became the center of the Levant region. 
Nehemiah had an intermediate objective and a final objective. The intermediate objective was to become the cupbearer to the Persian king so that he could be sent out as a governor. The final objective was to become the joy of God and the joy of neighbors. Indeed, the sound of the laughter was the polar opposite to the sound of cries and lamenting 150 years ago. Nehemiah made Jerusalem a safe place where women and children could feel at peace and be joyous. To the people who gathered, Nehemiah made them restore the system of offering tithe. With this, those who worked in the temple were able to do so without worrying about their living expenses. Fourth point. After 12 years as governor, Nehemiah returned to Persia and then later returned to Jerusalem once again to continue the Reformation. After 12 years as the governor, Nehemiah returned to Persia and then returned to Jerusalem after that. However, when Nehemiah returned to Jerusalem from Persia, he came across a great deal of issues he had to solve. First, the temple needed to become purified of evil. Nehemiah found that Tobiah was using a big room in the temple by himself. To sort this out, Nehemiah sent Tobiah out and restored the room to how it used to be. Nehemiah made the Levites return and to start working in the temple again. They had left in the first place because the people stopped paying tithe, which meant that they were unable to earn a living. In order to solve this, Nehemiah told the people to pay tithe. Nehemiah prayed to God about this and recorded his prayer in his book. Nehemiah also came to find that the people were not keeping Sabbath, and so emphasized to the people the importance of keeping Sabbath. With the traders from Tyre coming in, the Levant region had become a prosperous place, and this led to the people of Jerusalem failing to keep Sabbath. They had forgotten to keep their promise that they had made not too long ago. Nehemiah then rebuked the people for intermarrying with the foreign people. Nehemiah prayed to God to curse those who broke their promise and blessed those who kept their promise. As such, Nehemiah worked ferociously in order to help the people become holy citizens in a kingdom of priests. Fifth point, when a kingdom of priests was re-established, Jerusalem became abandoned again, and this brought in traders and sellers from Tyre, which made Jerusalem even more prosperous. Whilst acting as governor, Nehemiah completely succeeded in the regional decentralization policy in the Levant region. Jerusalem, which was a fox then during the night, had grown into a wealthy and prosperous place again. Nehemiah's record lists both the regulations in a kingdom of priests concerning Sabbaths and festivals and also the Persian Empire's policy. The system of a kingdom of priests meant that Jerusalem inevitably grew wealthy again. Then came the sellers and traders from Tyre. Jerusalem's prosperity helped Persia to become the empire of gold. The returned captives were also able to enjoy an abundant life. The problem here was that they had started to neglect Sabbath, which Nehemiah came back and rebuked them for. Day 280, Malachi 1-4 The absence of acknowledging God's 1,500 years of love. God's love, which was constant towards Israel for 1,500 years, was rejected due to the people's indifference and ignorance. First point. Chronologically, Malachi should be read after reading Ezra and Nehemiah. Malachi is the last book in the Old Testament. Chronologically, 
Malachi was written around the same time as Ezra and Nehemiah, and thus it is beneficial to read Malachi after reading Ezra and Nehemiah. Ezra's ministry focused on the returned captives and their repentance. Nehemiah's ministry focused on the reconstruction of the temple walls and the system of paying tithe. Malachi, on the same lines, also delivered God's message to the people. God spoke for 47 out of 55 verses in the book of Malachi. And this was the highest percentage of God speaking directly, 85.4%. This was because the returned captives were going in the way of a surface-level worship. The Bible records numerous types of offerings which were done just as a show. The first example is Saul. The second is Jeroboam, who changed the price and method of making offering altogether. Third, the people of North Israel and South Judah were also in this state, and thus were rebuked by Amos, Hosea, Isaiah, and Micah in 8th century BC. Fourth was when Nehemiah returned to Jerusalem for the second time, and the people had no heart in their offering. Now God rebuked the people through Malachi for their heartless offering. After the construction of the Jerubbabel Temple, the people no longer served idols, but they also did not wholeheartedly serve God. They offered to God low-quality offerings that they would never have offered to their governor. They made offerings to God with diseased and infected animals. God, through Malachi, stated that this was all just a show for them. Second point, Malachi recorded the very unfortunate conversation between God and the people. A long time ago, God had made a covenant with Abraham's descendants on Mount Sinai. And for 1,500 years, God loved them continuously. But Abraham's descendants who entered Canaan sinned before God for 900 years. And despite God's punishment through Assyria and Babylon, they continued to sin afterwards. To these people, God told them that he had loved them for 1,500 years. But to this, the people asked how God had loved them. Because of this, God did not speak for the next 400 years. The next thing God showed was Jesus Christ, a true symbol of how he had loved and loves us. Third point, God rebuked the priestess for making the people go in wrong directions. When God first gave the people the laws of the kingdom of priestess, he told them not to wander from left to right. God said this to Joshua. He also said this to South Judah through Isaiah, through Daniel, and to the returned captives through Malachi. Now God pointed out the sins of the priestess. God declared that he wished to close the gates of the temple because of the sins of the priestess. God indeed eventually closed the gates of the temple for Israel. He planned to be glorified by all nations. This was to be fulfilled by Jesus Christ, the Messiah. God then warned the people through Malachi. God used very strong words to pour out the most severe curses on the people as a warning. Animal excrement after the offering was supposed to be burned outside the temple. God told the priests, that the excrement would be smeared on their faces. The reason why God caused them to such an extent was because the priests had led the people in wrong directions, broken the covenant of Levi, confused the people of the law, and did not keep to God's ways. Thus, God declared that he would punish them severely. God wanted the priests to mediate between God and the people and to be responsible for the tasks involved in the temple. However, they went in the opposite direction. First point, God rebuked the returned captives for stealing tithe and offerings. God told Malachi that the Messiah was to come soon. 
This was a response to the question of where God's justice had gone. After declaring the coming of the Messiah, God told the people through Malachi to repent. God rebuked the people for stealing tithes and offerings. God then told the people to offer sincere tithes. God said that a sincere tithe would ensure that they would prosper and their surrounding countries would become most envious of them. Fifth point, God declared that on his decided day, he would send a rider to the people. God told Malachi that the returned captives were going against God. At the time, the people had doubts of whether God really existed. They moreover thought that the arrogant people became blessed and that the evil prospered and proclaimed that God was not righteous. To this, God declared that he would record the names of those who obeyed him. God moreover claimed that on his day, he would judge the world. God went on to explain the final judgment day. God would punish the evil and bless the righteous. Now God gave the conclusion to the entire Old Testament. He told the people to remember and implement God's laws and regulations. God also proclaimed that he would send Elijah. The Elijah God spoke of here was referring to John the Baptist. As such, God revealed his grieving heart to Malachi and went into a deep silence for 400 years. But then God, with his grace and mercy, sent John the Baptist before sending Jesus Christ to the people. 400 years later, the people heard John the Baptist say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Day 281 Matthew 1 to 4. Jesus, good news. God sent his only son, Jesus Christ, to the world in order to realize the promise of salvation for all humankind he planned since the beginning. First point Matthew chapter 1 contains 2,000 years of history. The Bible contains 2,000 years. 1,500 places and 5,000 people. In terms of time, from Abraham to the time of Jesus was 2,000 years. The Bible also sees time through the concept of Sabbath, Sabbath career, and Jubilee, as well as the other festivals. In terms of places, there are 1,500 recorded places including the promised land Canaan. In terms of people, there are 5,000 recorded, including Abraham, Moses, Joshua, David, Jesus, and St. Paul, all those who obeyed God. There are also those who disobeyed God, the ten spies who went to Canaan, Jeroboam, the false prophet Hananiah, as well as the Sadducees and the Pharisees. We needed to see time, place, and people through time. The 39 books in the Old Testament provide the backstory for the coming of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Matthew chapter 1 records the names from Abraham to David, and then from David to Jesus Christ. Among the many kings in the genealogy, only David was referred to as King David. Another interesting aspect is the mention of the five women, Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, Mary, the mother of Jesus, but the only woman whose name was not written was Basusheba. Instead, she was recorded as Raya's wife. This was Matthew's intention to outline that even the great David was a sinner before God. Even David needed the forgiveness of Jesus Christ to be saved. Matthew also recorded the instant of Jesus' birth and how the shepherds and the Magi came to Bethlehem to celebrate. The Old Testament on many occasions predicted the birth of the Messiah. The first was the prophet Isaiah who proclaimed that 
the descendant of David would be born as the Messiah. God moreover told Isaiah that Jesus would be born from a virgin. God told Micah that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. Through Hosea, God declared that Jesus would flee to Egypt. Through Jeremiah, God proclaimed that Jesus' birth would bring about the massacre of babies. Jesus was born in Bethlehem and then grew up in Nazareth. After being baptized by John the Baptist, Jesus started his three-year public life. Second point, the reason the Roman Empire made Herod the king of Judea was because they studied and knew about the Assyrian, Babylonian, Persian, and the Hellenistic empires. The Roman Empire was educated in the history of the previous empires, and therefore they tolerated the religious activities of the Jews, but still required them to pay tax. Furthermore, the reason Herod, who was a descendant of Edom, was made king was because he was a skilled politician who could handle the learning of the temple. We can see what a sly politician he was through the instant of the Magi, who came to ask him where the king of the Jews had been born. Herod was someone who did not hesitate to kill his son in order to keep his position. We can imagine so easily what was going on in his head when he heard that the king of the Jews had been born. Herod told them that he also wished to go and worship him. He was so convincing that the Magi intended to report to Herod where Jesus was. However, not long afterwards, Herod showed his real intentions. It was here that Joseph and Mary took Jesus to Egypt in order to save his life. Third point, prophets began with Abraham and then ended with John the Baptist. Every occupation is made in the market. However, a prophet can only be appointed by God. This is because a prophet is one that spreads God's message. The first prophet was Abraham. The last prophet was John the Baptist. In between, Abraham and John the Baptist was a kingdom of priests and the laws. Thus, the Old Testament concerns the laws and the prophets, which Jesus Christ completed through the kingdom of God. With the end of the 400-year intertestamental period, God sent his last prophet, John the Baptist. The appearance of John the Baptist was the fulfillment of God's words spoken through the prophet Isaiah. John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness whilst proclaiming that the kingdom of heaven was near and thus the people were to repent. Repent meant that the people were to turn their hearts to God. First point, Jesus depicted Satan through what was written in the Old Testament. Before starting his public life, Jesus was led by the Holy Spirit to be tested by Satan in the desert and fasted while praying for 40 days. Jesus was tested by Satan to become an economic messiah, spiritual messiah, and then a political messiah. Jesus was able to defeat Satan all three times through the records in Deuteronomy. We must also remember that the way to defeat Satan is through the living word. Fifth point, as Isaiah predicted, Jesus' ministry began near the river of Galilee. Jesus defeated Satan and then went out to start his public life. Jesus' ministry was to speak of heaven and the kingdom of God. Not long afterwards, John the Baptist was put into prison. The reason John the Baptist was put in prison was because of the incident with Herodia. The reason Jesus set out for Galilee after hearing the news that John the Baptist was taken to prison was in order to fulfill God's words, spoken through Isaiah that his ministry would start in Galilee. In Galilee, Jesus started to recruit his disciples.
Day 282, Matthew 5-7 Jesus' Teachings on the Mountains Jesus' sermon that is the most widely known throughout history began with a question, Who is blessed? It ended with emphasis on practicing faith. First point, Jesus taught the people to call God Father. Jesus' public life started and immediately Jesus started teaching the people. Back when God gave the laws to the people of Israel after Exodus, they were unable to come before God. But during Jesus' time, many people came close to Jesus and were able to learn from him directly. Jesus taught that those who were poor in spirit would be able to go to heaven. Jesus, moreover, taught about the people who would be welcome in the kingdom of God. They would act as the salt and light of the world. Jesus also taught the people to call God Father. Jesus referred to God the Father 17 times in order to teach the people. As such, the kingdom of God taught by Jesus enabled the people to call God our Father. Reference to God as our Father in the Old and New Testaments are as follows. Yet you, Lord, are our Father. We are the cry, you are the porter. We are all the work of your hand. He will turn the hearts of the parents to their children, and the hearts of the children to their parents. Or else I will come and strike the land with total distortion that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Be perfect, therefore, and your heavenly Father is perfect. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Second point, Jesus taught the people to interpret and receive the laws through the heart of God. The laws of God that Jesus taught the people were very different to that of the teachings of the Sadducees and the Pharisees. Jesus taught the people to obey God and to interpret God's laws through the heart of God. Jesus also taught the Sadducees and Pharisees to listen to his new interpretation. The first regarded murder, the second regarded adultery, the third regarded divorce, the fourth regarded making an oath, the fifth regarded revenge, the sixth regarded one's enemies. As such, God introduced the kingdom of God to the people through these new interpretations. Third point, Jesus taught the people how to pray, forgive, and fast. To the people who prayed, forgave, and fasted as a form of a show, Jesus taught them how to do them properly. The first regarded aid. Jesus taught that aid should be carried out in private. The second regarded prayer. Jesus taught the people how to pray and this was not to pray loudly in the streets, but to go and pray in private where only God could hear. He just gave words to teach the people exactly how to pray to God. The third regarded forgiveness. The fourth regarded fasting. God had touched on this topic in the Old Testament through Isaiah. God also spoke through Jeremiah about fasting. Jesus taught that God sees in secret. Fourth point, in the kingdom of God, one soul is more precious than the world. Jesus taught about the value of one soul, and he implemented this in five ways. Feeding, hearing, teaching, forgiving, and praying. Jesus said that one soul was more precious than the borders of the air, flowers of the field, 2,000 pigs, and even the whole world. Jesus also taught about the hearts 
the people want to practice. First, one's heart should be in the heavens. Second, one should not worry. Jesus taught that one could not serve both money and God, and that the most important thing for the people was to first search for his kingdom and his will, and have a faith that God would provide the rest. Fifth point, Jesus taught how the people were to treat their neighbors in the kingdom of God. Jesus taught the people how to treat their neighbors. The first was not to criticize. The second was to search and to knock. Jesus also taught about the golden rule in a relationship with one's neighbors. Jesus also taught to enter through a narrow gate. Another important lesson was to avoid false prophets. The last was to go and act. When the people heard all this, they were shocked to say the least. Day 283, Matthew 8-10 Jesus and a Kingdom of Priests Jesus chose his twelve disciples to be with him as well as healing and comforting the poor and the weak. First point, Jesus healed the man with leprosy and then sent him to the priest according to the regulations in a kingdom of priests. Matthew recorded Jesus' ministry through themes. The five main themes were feeding, hearing, teaching, forgiving, and praying. To first look at healing, Jesus healed countless people during his public life, and each time he healed someone, he told them not to tell others. However, when he healed a man with leprosy, he told him to go to a priest and show his body according to the regulations written in Leviticus. So, how long was it until this law was buried? This was until Jesus shouted, It is finished on the cross. If it was not relevant, then Jesus would not have told the man to show his body to the priest. As such, we can learn that Jesus did indeed come to fulfill the laws and the prophets. Second point, Jesus healed the people by using his own hands. The story of Jesus healing the people continues. Jesus used his two hands to heal the people. Although he had the power to heal them through command, he instead used his hands. Jesus healed a man with leprosy, Peter's mother-in-law, a young girl, a person who was deaf and could barely speak, and also a blind person. Later, Jesus took on the cross in order to save us all. There were also cases where Jesus healed the sick by commanding. Jesus healed a beloved servant of a Roman commander of a hundred who had very big faith in Jesus. Jesus healed many more others during his ministry. Third point, the four Gospels tell the story of God's burning love for the people which was described previously in the book of Hosea. During his ministry, Jesus also healed a paralyzed man. Here it is written that he forgave the paralyzed man's sins due to the faith of his friends who carried him there. All throughout, we can learn that Jesus' interest was always on the people's faith. Next, Matthew records the calling of Jesus' disciples. Tax collectors at the time were considered sinners and traitors, as they were working for the Roman Empire. However, Jesus befriended the tax collectors and made them his disciples, whereas the Pharisees thought about their righteousness and stressed the heavy yoke. Jesus spoke of God's compassion, which led many people to obey him. Fourth point, Jesus became a support for the weak in society. People in the world act weak in front of the strong and strong in front of the weak. However, Jesus supported the weak in society all throughout his three-year public life. 
This image was the fulfillment of God's word through Isaiah. Jesus looked after all those who were weak and fragile in society, and a representative example was Matthew, who changed from tax collector Matthew to Jesus' disciple Matthew. Jesus spent a great deal of his time healing the people, and this included healing a woman who had been bleeding for the past 12 years. Jesus also healed a synagogue leader's daughter. Jesus for the Boa healed two blind men. He also healed a mute man who was demon-possessed. However, the Pharisees did not perceive Jesus' healing ministry with a good eye. They failed to see that the reason Jesus healed and taught them was because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Fifth point, Jesus called his disciples and trained them for three years so that they would be able to take on the 30 years of age. Jesus called his 12 disciples as he began his ministry. Jesus selected them and trained them for three years as their well age, passing on his powers to them. And this was all in order to prepare them for the 30 years of age. They were the ones who were to lead the church. Jesus taught them how to spread the gospel and also taught them how to be wise and to let go of fear. He also taught them to praise their priority in the kingdom of God. Day 208-4 Matthew 11-13 If you take Jesus' yoke, Jesus' parables contained the deep wisdom and truth about the kingdom of God. First point, the appearance of John the Baptist was the fulfillment of God's words spoken through Isaiah and Malachi. 400 years after the prophet Malachi prophesied, John the Baptist, whom both Isaiah and Malachi had prophesied, came into sin. John the Baptist came and proclaimed the kingdom of God and told the people to repent. The people had not heard God's message for the past 400 years, and so when the people heard, they had the heart to repent. John the Baptist came into sin prior to Jesus' public life, and he made the way for Jesus. However, John the Baptist was put into prison, and afterwards, Jesus started to proclaim the kingdom of God. John sent his disciples to Jesus to ask a question. John had heard of what Jesus was doing whilst he was locked in prison. When John asked through his disciples whether Jesus was indeed the Messiah, Jesus gave an answer. Jesus referenced the words of the prophet Isaiah and thereby changed the perception of what John had in mind of the Messiah. As declared by Isaiah, Jesus the Messiah healed the person who could not walk, as well as the man with leprosy, and also the man who could not hear. Jesus also spread God's words to the poor, so that Jesus' disciples would not misunderstand John the Baptist. Jesus introduced John as the Elijah of this generation. Jesus explained that John was the prophet pre-warned by the prophet Malachi. Second point, Jesus' disciples took on Jesus' yoke and ultimately became apostles. There were religious leaders at the time that, despite hearing John the Baptist's warning to repent and Jesus' message, had many things to say about Jesus. Thus, Jesus rebuked the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. Jesus also rebuked those who did not repent, even after seeing Jesus perform many wonders. Jesus used the words that were spoken by Isaiah. The reason Jesus used these words was because the people refused to believe, despite seeing all the symbols and signs. 
Oppositely to those who believed and had faith, Jesus invited them to come to him. Jesus told them to let go of the heavy yoke of the world and rest by him. This was because Jesus' yoke was easy and light. When the Jews heard the word yoke, they immediately thought of Jeremiah's yoke. In fact, the first mention of the yoke was by Rehoboam, the son of Solomon. After that, Jeremiah had spoken of the wooden yoke and the iron yoke. Upon these words of Jeremiah, Jesus spoke of his yoke. During the three years of Jesus' public life, the people who were with him were able to enjoy his lighter yoke. And then after Jesus' death, his disciples carried on his mission for the next 30 years. Third point, Jesus declared that the Lord of the Sabbath, which God made during creation, was Jesus himself. When the Jews heard the teachings of Jesus, they were moved and started following him. However, this spurred jealousy from the religious leaders, such as the Sadducees, Pharisees, and the teachers of the laws. Thus, they started to ask Jesus a trick question concerning Sabbath. In response, Jesus brought up the instant of David and his men, and rebuked those who questioned. At the time, David was running away from Saul and had asked for food in the house of a priest Ahimelech. Jesus continued to refer to the words written in Deuteronomy and declared that he was bigger than the temple. Jesus pointed out that those who rebuked Jesus did more work during Sabbath. Jesus went one step further and reported to the records written in Hosea. The concept of Sabbath was made when God created the universe. And then during the days of Moses, keeping Sabbath became the laws of a kingdom of priests. Ultimately, Jesus declared that he was the Lord of the Sabbath. These people, however, came to rebuke Jesus later when Jesus healed the sick during the bath. This led to the Pharisees ultimately deciding to kill Jesus. To this, Jesus also rebuked their hypocrisy. Fourth point, Jesus claimed that he was bigger than the prophet Jonah and then warned about the cross and his death. The attack from the teachers of the law and the Pharisees grew worse. One day, they asked Jesus for a sign and to that. Jesus declared that Jonah's miracle was enough of a sign that signified the cross and his resurrection. At that point, Jesus' brothers came to find him. It was here that Jesus taught the people about the concept of family in the kingdom of God. Fifth point, Matthew recorded all seven metaphors Jesus used to explain the kingdom of God. Matthew recorded all seven metaphors spoken by Jesus to explain the kingdom of God. Jesus frequently used the metaphors in order to explain concepts. Within the three years, Jesus proclaimed the kingdom of God. All those who listened, including children, were able to learn and understand. Jesus used the parable of the sower, weeds, mustard seeds, yeast, hidden treasure, pearl, and net. Right then, Jesus taught in his hometown, but there were those who excluded Jesus. Because of this, Jesus replied to the time Jeremiah also spoke in his hometown. Day 285, Matthew 14 to 16. Jesus is a healing ministry. Jesus performed many miracles, and this was his method of approaching the Word of God and teaching the people to love their neighbors. First point Ever since creation, God has continuously healed us. Matthew recorded thoroughly of how Jesus spent a great deal of his public life. 
healing the sick, and also teaching them about God's love. Matthew also recorded the death of John the Baptist, as well as Jesus' merciful heart towards the weak and poor. Matthew pointed out that John the Baptist came to the world to prepare for the appearance of Jesus Christ. When this happened, Jesus left to avoid Herod and his men, and took a boat to reunite with his disciples. Many people followed Jesus on his way. Jesus was merciful towards them, and he did not hesitate to heal each and every one of them. As such, we can see how Jesus healed and fed countless people. Among many of Jesus' miracles, the miracle of the five loaves of bread and two fish is exemplary. The reason for this miracle was firstly because Jesus did not want to just send them home. Secondly, Jesus wanted to teach his disciples about the mission. Thirdly, Jesus wished to show them that he was the bread of life. After performing this miracle, Jesus went to a quiet place to pray in the mountains. That night, Jesus and his disciples met a great storm, and it was here that Jesus walked on water. Peter immediately tried to follow Jesus. Seeing this, the disciples confessed that Jesus was indeed the Son of God. Jesus then healed more sick people. Second point, the Sanhedrin assembly sent their Pharisees and teachers of the laws to Galilee where Jesus was in order to start a debate. When news about Jesus spread all throughout Judea, the whole of the Sanhedrin assembly, as well as Herod Antipas, started to feel threatened by Jesus. Before then, it was only the Sadducees and the Pharisees who personally questioned and debated with Jesus. But now, the scale of the threat grew. The Sanhedrin assembly went as far as to send some of their Pharisees and teachers of the laws to where Jesus was in order to investigate what was going on. When they met Jesus, they started to question about the traditions of the elders. Jesus replied by asking them why they cared so much about the traditions when they did not care to keep God's laws properly. Jesus replied to the fifth law in the Ten Commandments. Jesus then rebuked them. Jesus replied to Coban, the act of devoting one's possessions to God, but in fact not paying back borrowed money or financially supporting one's parents. As such, Jesus rebuked those who denied their parents, but still debated on the matter of tradition. God's laws had its foundation in the love. People should have for one another and for God. However, as time went by, the people had interpreted the laws as they wished and set their commandments above God's commandments. Third point, Jesus used his sacred hands to heal the sick. Jesus had three steps in healing the sick. The first was a merciful heart. Through this, he restored the people and healed them. The second was his spirituality. He healed the people with God's spiritual powers. The third was with his two hands. On one occasion, Jesus went to the region of Tyre and Sidon. Here, Jesus heard the outcry of a Canaanite woman. To this, Jesus did not answer back softly. Eventually, the girl was healed through the faith of her mother, and Jesus praised her mother's faith. After healing her, Jesus continued to heal many more people. Thus, they praised the God of the Israelites. Jesus then fed more people with a sympathetic heart. Fourth point, the Sadducees and Pharisees were different groups, but they came together to go against Jesus. One day, some Sadducees and Pharisees came to test Jesus and asked him for a sign. To them, 
Jesus provided his answer. The Sadducees and Pharisees were normally different groups. To firstly look at the Sadducees, they were financially prestigious. They did not believe in resurrection, only believed in the Pentateuch, only cared for the Jerusalem temple and were largely responsible for nailing Jesus on the cross. To secondly look at the Pharisees, they were financially comfortable, believed in resurrection as well as angels and spirits, believed in all 39 books in the Old Testament, were self-righteous and were also largely responsible for nailing Jesus on the cross. What they had in common was their hypocrisy. They also rebuked Jesus together. Fifth point. After Peter's spiritual confession, Jesus started to publicly talk about his ministry of the cross. Peter made a spiritual confession to Jesus. Peter confessed that Jesus was the Son of God, and then Jesus told him about the suffering he would endure soon. When Jesus predicted his death and Peter tried to stop him, Jesus also rebuked Peter and told Satan to get behind him. This was the same thing Jesus said to Satan when he tested him in the desert. As such, Jesus told his disciples of the suffering he was soon to endure. Jesus moreover told them about his resurrection, ascension, and then his second coming. Day 286 Matthew 17 to 20. The three conditions to become a big person in heaven. Jesus taught the disciples who quarreled about who was greater, that the principle of the kingdom of heaven was that the humble person was the greatest. First point, the conversation Jesus had with Moses who represents the laws and Elijah who represents prophets, symbolized that Jesus indeed came to fulfill the laws and the prophets. Six days after Peter's spiritual confession, Jesus took Peter, James, and John to the mountains. Right on, we see that Peter became the representative disciple. James became the first martyr for Christianity and John lived until the end to write Revelation in the island of Patmos. During his three-year public life, Jesus distinguished these three and showed them more of Jesus' ministry. First, Jesus showed them the miracle of raising the girl from the dead. Here, the three were able to have a hope for resurrection. Second, they were shown Jesus transfigured before them. Here, they were able to see Jesus' glory. Third, Jesus took the three when he went up to pray in Gethsemane. Here, they saw how Jesus obeyed God's will and how he chose the path of suffering in order to save the people of the world. When Jesus was transfigured, he spoke to Moses and Elijah. In the Old Testament, Moses symbolizes the laws and Elijah symbolizes the prophets. Jesus shared a conversation with the two, which moreover symbolized how he indeed came to fulfill the laws and the prophets. During this conversation, Peter offered to put up a shelter, and here he heard a voice from heaven. Peter, James, and John were so afraid that they knelt down. As God had told the people to listen to Moses, God now told the three disciples to listen to Jesus. John later recorded more images of Jesus' transfiguration in Revelation. It was here that Jesus taught the three that the Elijah God reported to in the book of Malachi was John the Baptist. Second point. In heaven, the humble person and children were greatest. Some time later, the disciples asked who was the greatest in heaven. Despite how Jesus had told them of his suffering twice, they still wanted to know who the greatest person in heaven was. We can learn 
that they still have the political image of the Messiah in their heads. At this, Jesus pointed to a young child to answer their question. Jesus claimed that not a single person was to be lost, and this was said by using the parable of the lost sheep. Next, Jesus taught them how to react when their brothers sinned against them. The first was to meet face to face, and this was an updated teaching from Leviticus. The second was to take one or two others along, so that every matter may be established by the testimony of witnesses. This was the revised teaching from Deuteronomy. The third was for the church to become their witness. If the person did not repent even after these three stages, they were to be excluded from the community. Jesus continued to teach his disciples about forgiveness. Jesus told them to forgive their neighbors without limit. As those listening were forgiven without limit, they were also to forgive others without limit. Third point, before heading to Jerusalem, Jesus ministered in the area of Judea and Berea. Matthew chapters 19 and 20 records Jesus' ministry in Judea and Berea before entering Jerusalem. However, the moment Jesus entered Judea, some Pharisees started to spot debate. They had the intention to put Jesus into trouble. At the time, there were various opinions and interpretations about divorce, and so they asked Jesus about this matter in order to attack him. Jesus answered them by referring to creation. Despite Jesus' clear answer, they asked him the same question again. Why then, they asked, did Moses command that a man give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away? As experts in the laws, they felt confident in attacking Jesus with reference to Deuteronomy, but of course they were no match against Jesus. Jesus told them to look deep for God's intentions, rather than what they understood as the law. Fourth point, the wealthy young man was unable to go as far as to give all his possession to the poor to enter heaven. One day, a wealthy young man came to Jesus and asked how he could gain eternal life. Jesus told him to keep the laws of Moses. The young man replied that he had done all this, and so Jesus gave him another answer. The first was to give up his possessions, and the second was for him to become Jesus' disciple. The young man, however, could not let go of his possessions, and thus he was unable to become Jesus' disciple. This young man wandered away and is still yet to return. He was unable to give up his possession as he failed to see that the real precious jewel was to be found in heaven. Afterwards, Peter asked Jesus what they would receive, as they had all left their possessions and were serving Jesus. There was a part of him that had doubts about eternal salvation. Jesus therefore told them that they would become the apostles of Jesus. Fifth point, Jesus predicted of the ridicule he would receive from the high priests and the teachers of the law before taking up the cross. Before entering Jerusalem, Jesus predicted his suffering for the third time. Despite such a prediction, Jesus' disciples were arguing about who would get the best seat in heaven. To James and John's mother, Jesus explained the policies of the kingdom of God. Although this mother had a ridiculous request, the other disciples were really no better. The others expressed fury to the two brothers. Jesus, however, went steadily in the way directed by God. Jesus then healed two blind people. The blind people cried out to Jesus to have pity on them. The way into heaven lies here. Only through God's pity on us, we are able to enter heaven. Day 287, Matthew 
21 to 23. Jesus is debate. As prophesied by Zechariah, Jesus, who entered Jerusalem riding on a donkey, wisely responded to the questions asked by the opposing adversaries. First point, Jesus entered Jerusalem on Sabbath and then resurrected on the next Sabbath and therefore spent his last week in Jerusalem. To outline the last week of Jesus' public life, he firstly entered Jerusalem during Sabbath. Jesus then taught during Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Afterwards, Jesus purified the temple, debated with the elders, told his disciples about the end of Jerusalem, and then told them about his second coming. On Thursday, he had the last supper with his disciples, and then headed towards Gethsemane to pray where he was captured. He was then taken to receive his trial. On Friday, he received Pontius Pilate's trial and was then nailed to the cross. Three days later, Jesus defeated death and resurrected. To firstly look into Jesus' entry into Jerusalem, he entered riding a donkey, as predicted by the prophet Zechariah. When Jesus entered, the people praised and greeted Jesus like a king. The people shouted Hosanna, the son of David. As such, Jesus received a definite greeting when entering Jerusalem. This was during Passover, and so the heights of excitement were indeed soaring. All the diaspora Jews had gathered to come together for Passover at this time. This incident was the most public event during Jesus' three-year public life. Second point, Jesus' entry into Jerusalem, Jesus' purification of the temple, and Jesus' teachings in the temple all led to the Sanhedrin assembly's attack on Jesus. After entering Jerusalem on Sabbath, Jesus purified the temple the next day. At the time, the court of the Gentiles had been removed, and they had made the area into a den of robbers. Jesus stressed, that the temple was a price for the world to come and pray, and this made the high priests and the teachers of the law fear. They decided that it was important to quickly kill Jesus. The reason they feared Jesus was firstly because of all the miracles Jesus performed during his public life. Secondly, they were afraid of the response Jesus got from the people as he entered Jerusalem. Thirdly, they were afraid because Jesus did not make an offering in the temple. Fourthly, they feared that something would happen in the temple following Jesus' purification of it. For these reasons, they decided to kill Jesus. Matthew wrote all this down in order to record Jesus and also to tell the Jews of the Messiah. Matthew chapters 21 to 22 records the five debates Jesus had with the high priests and the elders within the Sanhedrin assembly. The first debate was about Jesus' right to purify the temple. At this, Jesus asked them with what rights John the Baptist gave baptisms. The second debate regarded the tax and whether it was right for them to pay tax to the Roman Empire. To this, Jesus told them to give to the Lord what belongs to the Lord and to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. The third debate was regarding the marriage at resurrection. To this, Jesus replied that God was for the living and that they misunderstood greatly. The first was the question from the teacher of the law, who asked which law came first. And to this, Jesus replied that it was to love God and to love your neighbor. The fifth was when Jesus asked the Pharisees what they thought about Christ and whose son he was. And to this they answered, David's descendant. Jesus responded that David called him Lord, and why he would do so 
if the Messiah was indeed descended from him, and thereby made the people unable to debate further. Jesus then used the parables, including the two sons of the vineyard owner and the sins of the vineyard workers. Through these parables, Jesus taught that the Jews would kill Jesus and that the disobedience of the Jews would instead lead to the salvation of all other nations. Third point, Jesus was confronted about the tax resurrection as well as the laws by the Sanhedrin assembly. Previously, the Sanhedrin assembly had confronted Jesus about various issues in the Jerusalem temple, but they were publicly humiliated through Jesus' answers. And so they came back to where Jesus was for another round. This time, they came with the issue of tax. They firstly wished to spur controversy, and paying tax to the Roman Empire at the time was a sensitive matter. This could have gotten Jesus into great trouble, and this was exactly their motivation. To their question, Jesus responded extremely clearly. Now the third debate began, and the Sadducees came to attack. This time they asked about the laws of marriage and resurrection, and of course, Jesus had an unbeatable answer. Jesus added that the Sadducees did not know the Bible or God properly, and that they misunderstood. Jesus replied to the words in Exodus in order to teach about resurrection. The fourth debate continued, and this time the attack was made by the teachers of the law. However, Jesus answered back with all the knowledge of the laws and the prophets as well as God's love. First point, when the Sanhedrin assembly discovered that they could not win Jesus through debate, they decided to kill him. Despite how the Sanhedrin assembly sent their widest debaters to Jesus, no one was able to win. All five times, they lost. Jesus also questioned them through the Old Testament, but the only answer they could provide was that the Messiah was the descendant of David, of which they stood on their own toes. Jesus corrected their knowledge about the Messiah, that the Messiah had God's spirituality. When the Sanhedrin assembly found out that they really could not defeat Jesus, they schemed to kill him. Fifth point, Jesus rebuked the Sanhedrin assembly with seven reasons and declared judgment on them. Jesus publicly rebuked the members of the Sanhedrin assembly for their hypocrisy. Jesus rebuked them for sitting in the chair of Moses but not implementing the laws, for not having any mercy, for doing actions for people to see rather than for God to see, for being greedy and for their arrogance. To this end, Jesus taught them that he was the only leader and teacher of all humans, and that God was their only father, and that people had nothing to be arrogant about. Jesus continued to rebuke the members of the Sanhedrin assembly for closing the doors of heaven for people to enter, directing the people into hell, for being greedy, for not having mercy or faith for being hypocritical, and for rebuking God's prophets. Jesus all in all rebuked them for not taking the opportunity that was given to them by God to restore Jerusalem and to repent. Day 208-8, Matthew 24-25 Jesus' is a story about the end. Jesus told the people about the last judgment day and its signs and warned them to believe the Lord's teachings. First point, Jesus' reference to the end of the world was later recorded by St. John in the island of Patmos. Jesus told his disciples that the Jerusalem temple would fall. As said by Jesus, in AD 70, the Jerusalem temple fell in the hands of the Roman Empire under General Titus, with not a single stone on top of the other. 
After talking about the temple, Jesus then spoke about the ends of the world. Jesus also explained the punishment that would follow with the end of the world. First, the false prophets would appear. Second, worse and earthquakes would occur. Third, the false prophets and others would stand to attack the Christians. Fourth, towards the end, the gospel would be spread to the ends of the earth. Then Jesus explained everything about the end. Jesus warned them not to be fooled by the words of the false prophets. The amazing thing here was that many decades later, John recorded all of this in further detail in Revelation. Second point, Jesus taught his disciples about the ends of the earth and then declared that he would come for the second time. Jesus taught his disciples about the ends of the earth and then about his second coming. A few days later, Jesus spoke of his second coming at the Sanhedrin assembly in front of the high priest and the assembly members. After resurrection, Jesus also told them of his second coming again as the angels took him up to heaven. During his second coming, unlike his first coming, he would come with great glory and power. Third point, Jesus declared that the only one to know about the date of his second coming was God. Jesus told his disciples about his second coming and how Christians were to prepare. Jesus added that only God knew of when Jesus' second coming would be, which meant that they were not to be fooled by the false prophets. Jesus then used the parables to teach them how they were to wisely prepare for Jesus' second coming. The first was the parable of the fig tree. The second was the parable of Noah's time. The third was about the second coming, which no one knew about. The fourth was the parable of the housekeeper and the thief. The fifth was the parable of the obedient and evil servant. Fourth point. Jesus taught how Christians were to wait for the second coming of Jesus. Jesus told his disciples that they were to wisely and patiently wait for the second coming of Jesus and use the parables to explain this. The first was the ten virgins. At the time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The second was the bags of gold parable. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. Fifth point, Jesus used the parable of the sheep and the goat to explain the standards of God's judgment. Jesus used the parable of the sheep and the goat to explain the standards of God's judgment. God's judgment would fall on all nations. The first would be the sheep on the right. The second would be the goats on the left. Jesus repeated the five acts of good that the sheep on the right carried out, which the goats on the left did not. And so Jesus said, then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Day 289, Matthew 26 to 28. The cross, all nations. The work of salvation for all humankind was achieved because of Jesus, who redeemed all sins and was the Lamb that was seized and killed by people. First point. Jesus changed the 1,500-year-old Passover to the first ever communion with his disciples. After predicting his suffering three times to his disciples, Jesus then predicted his suffering for the fourth time. Jesus indeed had enormous plans for the 1,500th commemoration of Passover, which he intended to change to the first ever communion. However, this involved the Son of Man 
being sold. As predicted by John the Baptist, Jesus was to be the Lamb of God for this Passover. Jesus was to become the Lamb of Sacrifice on the cross and ultimately end the system of making offerings to God in the temple. Jesus' suffering was going to his plan. One day, a woman came forth in preparation for Jesus' death. All Matthew, Mark, and John recorded the instant of the woman pouring perfume on Jesus before going to Jerusalem. It was customary in Judea to pour perfume over the guest's head during a feast as a sign of a celebration. The woman had poured perfume over Jesus' head in order to make Jesus shine. But when the disciples saw this, they expressed discomfort. Judas Iscariot especially expressed resentment towards this, and so Jesus told them to leave her alone. Matthew immediately records the betrayal of Judas Iscariot. Jesus had already declared that he was to take the cross this Passover, but the high priests had decided that they would not kill Jesus this time round. But Judas Iscariot's betrayal provided the high priests a reason and opportunity to kill Jesus this Passover. Judas Iscariot appeared before the high priests and received the money in exchange for betraying Jesus. Jesus prepared for the final Passover after entering Jerusalem. Jesus then predicted the betrayal of Judas Iscariot. Jesus went ahead and changed the 1,500-year-old Passover to the first ever communion. And then Jesus headed towards the Mountain of Olives with his disciples. Second point, Jesus received the first Sanhedrin assembly trial. Historically, after the fall of North Israel followed the fall of South Judah, and this ultimately ended the 500 years of monarchy. After the Babylonian captivity ended for South Judah, they were then governed by the Persian Empire, which led to the return of the captives to Jerusalem under the permission of the Persian Empire. With Ezra being sent back to Jerusalem, the Sanhedrin assembly became established. As such, the Sanhedrin assembly was founded by Ezra, and this assembly continued all throughout the Persian, Hellenistic, and Roman empires. The Sanhedrin assembly conducted Jesus' trial, and then later conducted Stephen's trial and St. Paul's trial. Before his trial, Jesus went to Gethsemane and prayed three times to God. Afterwards, he was arrested by the Sanhedrin assembly. It was at this time that Peter sliced off an ear. Jesus, however, told Peter that those who used the sword would die by the sword, and that his arrest was to occur, as predicted in the Old Testament. Jesus explained to Peter that he had the power to bring the angels from heaven, but he was staying still in order to fulfill what was written in the Old Testament. That night, Jesus was taken to the court of the high priest to receive a trial from the Sanhedrin assembly. The trial turned out to be full of false accusations, all in order to kill Jesus. They found evidence for Jesus' mockery of the Holy Temple. Jesus remained silent throughout the trial until the high priest asked him whether he was the Son of God. To this, Jesus answered yes. Jesus' answer contained all the content regarding the cross, resurrection, ascension, as well as the Son of God. If the high priestess and the Sanhedrin assembly had been true religious leaders, they would have bowed down before Jesus. However, the reason they did not was because they neither believed nor waited for the Messiah. When Jesus told the assembly that he was indeed the Son of God, they tore their clothes, spat on Jesus, hit him, and generally beat him.
They then decided to kill him for the sin of blasphemy. As such, Jesus was questioned all throughout the night by the assembly and during this time. Peter denied Jesus three times as Jesus had predicted. Third point. During the trial, Pontius Pilate tried three times to save Jesus and also gave three commands. On Thursday night, Jesus was questioned in the court by the Sanhedrin assembly. And then on Friday morning, he was passed to Pontius Pilate for another round of trial. The assembly's only motivation was to kill Jesus. And with this, they handed Jesus to Pontius Pilate. Pontius Pilate had been forced into the scheme of the Sanhedrin assembly. The Sanhedrin assembly used their influence on Pontius Pilate, and so he could not refuse their offer. However, Pilate also knew that Jesus was famous to the Jews, and so this was indeed a difficult trial. Pilate asked Jesus whether he was the king of the Jews, and Jesus answered yes to him. When the questioning continued, Jesus once again remained silent. Pilate asked Jesus once again. The assembly suggested crucifying Jesus on the cross according to the punishment of the Roman Empire. Thus, Jesus became crucified on the cross. Pontius Pilate, who agreed to this, was the fifth governor over Judea for 10 years since AD 26, during the reign of Emperor Tiberius, the second emperor of Rome. After the incident of Jesus' cross, Pontius Pilate was ordered to commit suicide and so died in AD 36. Pilate tried three times to not crucify Jesus on the cross, and this was because he knew that Jesus, being the Son of God, had nothing to do with Roman law. Therefore, Pilate tried not to get involved. Also, the reason Pilate tried to pass Jesus back to the Sanhedrin assembly was because he knew that they did this out of spite. During Pilate's trial, he asked Jesus once again whether he was the king of the Jews. This was his attempt to turn the tables for the people accusing Jesus of blasphemy. Pilate also tried to release Jesus through the card of Passover, but he was unable to do this. Here Pilate was able to sense a change in atmosphere from the Jews. He realized that they were not the same as those who cheered when Jesus entered Jerusalem. He realized that these people were paid to scream murder. Pilate's Passover cut did not succeed. Thus, Pilate ordered the crucifixion of Jesus. The high priests got what they wanted. Pilate, however, said yes to Joseph of Arimathea's request to take down Jesus' body. Pilate then sent Roman soldiers to guard Jesus' tomb. Fourth point, the prophecy about Jesus' suffering on the cross was made a reality by the Sanhedrin assembly and Pontius Pilate's trial. As soon as Pilate ordered for Jesus' crucifixion, the people started to mock Jesus. This was the fulfillment of the words of the prophet Isaiah. The Roman soldiers dragged Jesus around whilst whipping him, and moreover tore Jesus' clothes and made him wear the clothes of the king to mock him further. They put a crown of thorns on his head and then crucified him. On his cross, they wrote, King of the Jews. Jesus died on the cross. The Sanhedrin assembly was very much satisfied that they had gotten what they wanted. They spread the news that Jesus was a blasphemer and that he was a self-proclaimed king of the Jews. They believed that they were at peace again and furthermore believed that Herod and Pilate were under their control. They made plans to fill their vaults with the tithe as they prepared for the next big religious event. Fifth point, the dream of all nations which God spoke through Abraham became fulfilled 2,000 years later through Jesus' resurrection, making all nations 
the disciples of Christ. Jesus, who died on the cross, defeated death and rose again. The women who heard this from the angel came to his tomb. This had been warned by Jesus in Galilee to the disciples. The women rejoiced when they saw Jesus. But when the soldiers who were guarding the tomb saw him, they turned pale with fear. However, they soon calmed down again when they received a large amount of money from the high priestess to spread false news. After Jesus resurrected, he fulfilled the words of God, which was spoken 2,000 years ago to Abraham to bless all nations. Jesus gave the great commission to all the people, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Day 290, Mark 1 to 3. Gospel, the Kingdom of God. Beginning his public life, Jesus chose and called the twelve disciples, taught them and carried out the deeds of the Kingdom of God with them. First point. Mark used the records of Isaiah and Malachi to study about John the Baptist and then linked this to the gospel of the kingdom of God. Right from the opening lines, Mark wrote that Jesus is the Son of God and that he came to this world to save all nations. The core of the book of Mark was the gospel. This gospel was about repentance about freeing people from evil spirits, restoration, truth, and healing. Mark started the story of Jesus with the story of John the Baptist. Mark recorded the story of John the Baptist who paved the way for Jesus' ministry. John the Baptist had a unique appearance. As the prophet Malachi prophesied, John the Baptist was the Elijah, God sent to the desert, to proclaim the coming of the kingdom of God. Second point, when Jesus was baptized, the Spirit of God came upon him and led him to the desert. Jesus started his three-year public life after being baptized by John and then being tested by Satan immediately after fasting in the desert for 40 days. The Spirit of God was with him the whole time. At the time Jesus received the baptism, the doors of heaven opened, and God's Spirit came upon him. Jesus had received John's repentance baptism. Jesus had gone to the position of the sinner, and this was where God's Spirit came upon him. After Jesus was baptized, the Spirit of God came and led him to the desert. Jesus then fasted in the desert for 40 days and then set out to fulfill the words in the Old Testament. Jesus' public life began, and the first thing to happen was the seizure of John the Baptist. This was because John had completed his mission. Jesus then recruited four disciples. Jesus then started his teaching. Jesus' ministry continued, and this involved healing Peter's mother-in-law. Jesus also prayed and spread God's word. Jesus also healed a leper and told him to show himself to the priest according to the laws of the kingdom of the priestess. Third point, Jesus who came to the world to call the sinners forgave the sins of the paralyzed. Jesus healed many sick people including those who were paralyzed. Jesus not only healed them but also forgave their sins. When the religious leaders of the time heard of this, they accused Jesus of blasphemy and schemed to kill him. Jesus knew this but continued with his public life. During Jesus' time, the Pharisees, teachers of the law, and the Sadducees each had different ways of thinking as well as different roots. However, they all came together to rebuke Jesus when they saw him eating with the sinners. To them, Jesus said that he came to call the sinners, not the righteous. What they failed to know was that they were also sinners. Jesus came to save everyone. Fourth point, the Lord of Sabbath 
Jesus healed many sick people during Sabbath. Jesus' public life was less less. During this time, a debate broke out about Sabbath. Jesus answered that he was the Lord of Sabbath. Despite how Jesus knew that the Sanhedrin assembly members were finding an excuse to arrest him, Jesus still taught them about the meaning of Sabbath and continued to heal the sick. As such, the Lord of Sabbath healed many sick people during Sabbath, and this included healing the demon-possessed man, Simon Peter's mother-in-law, the man with the shriveled hand, the woman who had been demon-possessed, and crippled for the past 18 years, as well as countless others. Fifth point, the disciples were extremely busy as they supported Jesus' ministry for three years, so much so that they did not even have time to eat properly. Jesus called 12 disciples to him during his public life. The standard for disciple selection was entirely made by Jesus. The only thing Jesus looked at was obedience. Jesus called his disciples so that they could be with him, so that he could educate them and for them to spread the gospel. Jesus gave them the powers to ward off demons. They were with him all throughout the three years and assisted Jesus through thick and thin. They endured all sorts of weathers and also hunger. They were often too busy to have time to eat. This was the life of Jesus Christ. Day 291, Mark 4 to 6. I love Jesus. Jesus performed countless miracles and considered the value of one soul more precious than the whole universe. First point, Jesus, who was tired from spreading so much love, could not even feel the storm. One day, Jesus was teaching the people as usual during his public life. Jesus used easy parables so that the people could easily relate to the kingdom of God, and this included the parable of the sower. Jesus taught many people, but not all of them took it in the same way. Some did not have faith to believe. Jesus spent the whole day teaching about the kingdom of God, and then when night came, he crossed the river of Galilee to head somewhere. A fierce storm came upon them, but Jesus did not wake up from his deep sleep. This was all because he was so tired. Jesus was woken up by his disciples, and he calmed the storm and wind. Jesus then rebuked his disciples for their little faith, and they feared Jesus' spirituality from that point forward. Second point, Jesus pierced through the wild storm in order to heal the demon-possessed man. The storm was so furious that even Peter, Andrew, John, and James, who were fishermen, could not deal with it. But Jesus slept through the storm without even starting. The price they had it, despite Jesus being so very tired, was to heal a man who was more precious than the world. Jesus went to a demon-possessed man who had been cast out from society. Even his family had given up on him, but Jesus went to find and then healed him. However, after Jesus performed the miracle of healing, the villagers begged Jesus to leave the area. Third point, Jesus healed the demon-possessed man and then sent him back to his family to bring them joy. The people who saw Jesus heal the demon-possessed man were afraid and asked Jesus to leave, but the man who was healed wished to follow Jesus. However, Jesus considered the man's family and told him to return to them. Jesus traveled all that way during the night in order to heal one man. Jesus had mercy and love for this one soul. Jesus did not hesitate to sacrifice 2,000 pigs in order to save one soul. 
Jesus then took the boat to get to the other side. This is where Jesus came across a woman who had been breathing for the past 12 years. She believed that she would be healed if she just touched Jesus and thus was saved by her faith. Fourth point, Jesus' disciples did not have enough time to eat because of their salvation ministry. Jesus sent his disciples out to the jobs. Later on, the early church also sent out pairs of workers to spread the gospel. The disciples were paired, and they were to go and make the people repent, and to spread the gospel as well as to ward off demons. They returned to Jesus once their job was done, and they then set out again with Jesus. Jesus and his disciples went to the people who were like sheep without their shepherd. This expression was in reference to Moses' prayer. May the Lord, the God who gives breath to all living things, appoint someone over this community to go out and come in before them, one who will lead them out and bring them in. So the Lord's people will not be like a sheep without a shepherd. The people who gathered to learn from Jesus now had to return home. However, they were all hungry, and there was not enough money to feed them all. Jesus told his disciples to feed them. Jesus performed the miracle of multiplying the fish and the bread and fed them all. Fifth point, Jesus walked on water in order to decrease the workload of his disciples. After the miracle of multiplying the fish and the bread, Jesus went to pray and then walked on water in order to reach his disciples. When the disciples saw that Jesus was walking on water, they were most surprised. Matthew recorded this instant that Peter, who fell in the water, called Jesus the Son of God, whereas Mark focused on the fact that the disciples still did not understand Jesus' identity. Jesus wished to decrease the workload of his disciples by walking towards them, instead of making them Low towards him. Jesus then had to heal more sick people. When the people heard that Jesus was coming, the sick gathered, hoping that Jesus would cure them. They believed that touching Jesus' lobes would heal their illness. Day 292, Mark 7 to 8. Jesus' loving conversations. Jesus, who went to those who needed him and devoted his time and sincerity, performed miracles of healing and practiced love. First point. Jesus took the man that could not hear and could barely speak far from the crowds and then healed him. Mark chapter 7 records the instant where the Sanhedrin assembly sent some Pharisees and teachers of the law to Galilee, where Jesus was, in order to find an excuse to carry him. They started the debate that Jesus' disciples did not keep the tradition of the elders. To them, Jesus taught that understanding the real intention behind God's laws was more important than any tradition. Jesus then left Galilee and went to Tyre, where he healed the daughter of a Canaanite woman. He left Tyre and went through Sidon back to Galilee, where he healed a man who was deaf and could barely speak. Jesus took the man away from the crowds and healed him through his hands. Jesus prayed to God with a merciful heart. After healing the sick, he told them not to tell anyone. However, Jesus' news spread throughout the land. Second point, to the people who came to learn about the kingdom of God for three days, Jesus performed a miracle by feeding them all. In Galilee, thousands of people gathered to hear about the kingdom of God. They heard for three days, and when it came for them to go home, they were all hungry. 
Jesus therefore performed the miracle of multiplying the bread and the fish for them to eat. This was because Jesus pitied them and knew full well the pain of being hungry. When Jesus told the disciples to feed the people, they said that this was impossible. However, Jesus performed another miracle in order to feed them. Third point, the yeast in the kingdom of God had to grow, but the yeast of the Pharisees and the Herod had to be approached with caution. One day, some Pharisees came to Jesus in order to push him into a trap and asked Jesus for a sign. Mark recorded that Jesus sighed after hearing their request to see a sign. Although the Old Testament provided countless signs of Jesus, they requested to see a sign from heaven. They had the intention to use this against him. Jesus' sigh was towards these evil people. The sign that they later saw was the cross and Jesus' resurrection. Jesus later warned his disciples to be cautious of the high priest and the herald's yeast. Yeast had the tendency of expanding. Therefore, the only yeast that should expand was the kingdom of God. The other yeasts were to be regarded with caution. The disciples, however, did not fully understand this warning. Jesus therefore explained it to them again, using easy metaphors and parables. Jesus told them that their hearts were still on the tangible bread, rather than the spiritual bread. Mark used various expressions to record how they still did not realize. First point, Jesus had a compassionate heart when healing the sick. Jesus now headed toward this Bethsaida in order to heal a blind man. The four Gospels record many instances where Jesus healed the blind man, but only Mark recorded the healing of the blind man at Bethsaida as well as the process. First, Jesus took the hand of the blind man and took him outside of the village. Second, he spat on his eyes and blessed him. Third, he asked him how he was. Fourth, he blessed his eyes once again and healed him completely. We can see how Jesus made such an effort to heal one man. Jesus had mercy in his heart towards the sick, as well as the spiritual ability to heal them. Fifth point, the crowds said that Jesus was like John the Baptist, Elijah, and Jeremiah. Jesus and his disciples headed towards Caesarea Philippi, and here Jesus asked them who the people thought he was. Jesus asked them what his public image was. At this, the disciples mentioned three people, John the Baptist, Elijah, and Jeremiah. Now Jesus asked them what they thought of him. At this, Peter replied that Jesus was the Messiah and the Son of God. Day 293, Mark 9-10 to Jesus transfigured. Jesus, who went up on the Mount of Transfiguration, told them about his death and resurrection in advance, but the disciples were unable to understand him. First point, Peter, John, and James experienced God's glory twice during Jesus' public life. Jesus took around all his disciples, and at times he only took a few with him. The three that he often separately took were Peter, John, and James. During Jesus' public life, these three experienced God's glory twice. The first was on Mount Tabor, and the second was meeting the resurrected Jesus. Peter confessed the glory he witnessed on Mount Tabor. The glory that they saw on the mountain was Jesus transfigured and having a conversation with Moses and Elijah. The three disciples were most shocked to witness this, and Peter offered to build a shelter for them. 
During this time, they heard a voice from heaven. They, at this point, had no idea about Jesus being raised from the dead. Jesus told them that Elijah was first to come, and that this symbolized John the Baptist. Second point, Jesus gave his disciples the power to drive out demons and also to heal the sick. During the time, the three disciples were witnessing God's glory on Mount Tabor. The last of the disciples were busy warding off demons and also were dealing with conflict with the teachers of the law trying to heal a boy who was demon-possessed. The boy was possessed by a demon, but the disciples could not heal him. And this is part of a debate with the teachers of the law. At this, Jesus rebuked them for their lack of faith. Jesus had already given them the powers to get rid of demons and also to heal the sick. Jesus rebuked them as they had little faith and told them that those who had faith lacked nothing. Jesus then healed the boy. Because of this, the disciples questioned their limitations. Mark recorded Jesus' teaching that other than prayer, nothing can be achieved, and this was all down to their lack of faith. Prayer reveals one's faith, and through faith, God works His powers. Third point, Jesus taught His disciples of everyone and all nations. One day, John, who was the youngest out of Jesus' disciples, asked Jesus a question. John thought that someone who was not Jesus' disciple should not be able to ward off demons. He believed that this should be the privilege of Jesus' disciples. Jesus taught John and the last of the disciples that anyone who had faith in the name of God was with them. As such, Jesus taught them about everyone and all nations when it came to Jesus' salvation. The disciples, after Jesus ascended to heaven, became Jesus' apostles, who implemented everyone and all nations. Fourth point, Jesus told his disciples about the great person in the world and the great person in God's kingdom. During the process of learning from Jesus, the disciples at times questioned who was great in the kingdom of God. To this, Jesus gave them answers. Mark chapter 10 illustrates how the Pharisees questioned Jesus about the divorce, as well as other issues in order to super controversy and trouble. Later on, when children tried to come to Jesus, but the disciples stopped him, Jesus told them that they were to be like children in order to enter heaven. The next questions were about eternal life and how to gain it. Following on, Jesus predicted his suffering for the third time. During this, the disciples once again got into the argument of who was greater between them. This showed how they were more concerned about their political glory more so than of what Jesus was saying. Jesus therefore brought up that whoever that drank from his cup would be with him. Jesus then told them the difference between the world's standards and the heaven's standards of what made a person great. Fifth point, although the wealthy young man left Jesus due to his wealth, the blind Bartimaeus ran to Jesus, throwing his cloak aside. A wealthy young man questioned Jesus on how he was to gain eternal life. However, when he heard Jesus' answer, he left with a serious face, and he was told to give away his wealth to the poor. As he was very wealthy, he could not do so. This wealthy young man and a man named Bartimaeus were living completely different lives. Bartimaeus was a blind beggar who confessed that Jesus was the Messiah and cried out to be saved. He asked the son of David to have mercy on him and learn to Jesus. This scene was not recorded in detail in Matthew or Luke, but only in Mark.
When Jesus called to him, he learned to Jesus. Although he could not see, he heard Jesus' voice and learned towards him. Although all that he owned was his cloak, he threw it aside and learned to Jesus. When Jesus saw this, he held him. He ultimately became a follower of Jesus Christ. Day 294, Mark 11 to 13, the last week. Jesus, who preached the gospel mostly in Galilee and to the Jerusalem, and walked step by step towards his final mission. First point, Jesus walked towards his final mission as he entered Jerusalem. Jesus' final week is recorded in Mark chapters 11 to 16. Now, Jesus entered Jerusalem to carry out his final mission. Mark closely recorded Jesus' actions as he gave courage and strength to the people. The reference to the kingdom of the Israelites' ancestor David only appears in the book of Mark. This was a way of welcoming Jesus into Jerusalem as the son of David. These people failed to see that Jesus would soon take the cross, resurrect, and then become the glory of the kingdom of God. At the time, the people of Judea hoped for the strong Messiah, recorded by Amos and Isaiah. However, Isaiah had recorded both the strong Messiah and also the Messiah who would suffer. Jesus as such entered Jerusalem with many people praising him and then took his disciples to Bethany. Second point, Jesus taught his disciples about faith and prayer through the instant of the dried up fig tree. After entering Jerusalem, Jesus looked around and then headed to Bethany with his disciples at night. The next morning, Jesus went from Bethany back to Jerusalem. And this was where Jesus came across a fig tree. Jesus looked at the leaves around the figs and spoke. Jesus cursed the figs, but this was not just a curse on the tree. It was a prediction that Jerusalem would fall. The next day, Peter saw that the figs dried up and so asked Jesus about it. With this, Jesus taught them about faith and prayer. Jesus taught them to have faith in God, to not have doubts to pray and believe that God would listen, and to forgive others. Third point, the issue of tax since the ancient day until now remains a sensitive issue. Mark chapter 12 records Jesus' parable about the vineyard farmer and then tax. Until recently, the Sanhedrin assembly had sent their best debaters to super controversy with Jesus. However, they were publicly embarrassed by Jesus. Now, Jesus entered the praying field of the Sanhedrin assembly, which was Jerusalem, and they once again tried to cause trouble. The first issue they threw was about tax. At the time, the issue of tax was a huge problem. As the Roman Empire had legislated for the people of Judea to pay an enormous sum, we can see just how serious this issue was with the birth of Jesus, as everyone was asked to register in order to pay tax. The Roman Empire at the time provided the people with bread and circus, and this was a part of their tolerance policy. The Romans also had a policy of paying the tax collectors in order to make sure that not a penny was left. Tax collectors were seen as traitors and were extremely frowned upon. Matthew and Zacchaeus were both tax collectors during this time, but the assembly came to Jesus with this very sensitive issue. They asked Jesus whether it was right of them to pay tax to the Roman Empire. If Jesus said yes, the Jews who followed Jesus until now would turn against him. If he said no, then this would have been a revolt against the Roman Empire. Jesus instead told them to show him a coin. 
it had the face of the emperor on it. He told them to give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what belongs to God. Fourth point, to the teacher of the law who agreed to Jesus' teaching, Jesus told him that he was not far from the kingdom of God. The fact that Jesus entered Jerusalem was worrying news for the Sanhedrin assembly. When they are questioned to Jesus about the tax was reserved by Jesus' answer. A teacher of the law came to ask a question. Jesus replied to him, and the teacher of the law who asked agreed with Jesus' answer. He was one of the few people from the Sanhedrin assembly who actually listened to Jesus. Therefore, Jesus had good things to say about him. Fifth point, Peter, John, James, and Andrew asked Jesus about the end of the world. There were many people who came and attacked Jesus with their very little knowledge about the Bible. Jesus therefore told them to refrain from speaking and rebuked them. After rebuking them, Jesus praised the widow who made an offering to God. Then Jesus went on to predict that the Jerusalem temple would fall soon. The reason Jesus said this was because of the sins in the Jerusalem temple. Although they called it a temple, it was actually a price used for all sorts of evil activity and Jesus judged this. Jesus predicted the fall of the temple and then taught his disciples about the end of the world. Then Peter, John, James, and Andrew asked Jesus more about the end of the world. Jesus gave them a reply. Jesus encouraged them that the Holy Spirit would always be with them. After this, the Sanhedrin assembly threatened Jesus during the second trial, and this led on to the third trial. The fourth trial later was the stoning of Stephen, and in the fifth trial they made St. Paul stand in front of them. Jesus continued to speak about his second coming. In chapter 13, Jesus told them to stay awake. Day 295, Mark 14 to 16, the last Passover and the first communion. Jesus spent his last hour with his disciples and took up the excruciating cross, then rose from the dead in three days as he had predicted. First point, before being crucified, Jesus changed the 1,500-year tradition of Passover to Holy Communion. Two days before Passover, the Sanhedrin assembly came together to discuss a very important matter. They discussed killing Jesus, but then decided that they would not do so this Passover. They feared that if they killed him during Passover, Jesus' followers would riot against them. Whilst they were having this important meeting, Jesus predicted that he would take the cross during this Passover. Now, Jesus and his disciples prepared for the Passover feast. Passover had been the most important festival for the past 1,500 years. But before taking the cross, Jesus changed this tradition to the Holy Communion and introduced the official coming of the kingdom of God. The traditional food for Passover was a year-old lamb, but this time Jesus prepared some bread and wine and fed it to the disciples, telling them that the wine was his blood and the bread was his body. From this point forward, Passover ended and it became the Holy Communion. The first Passover had occurred 1,500 years ago after Exodus. The second Passover was kept the following year by the Israelites in the desert. Afterwards, Passover was kept by King Hezekiah of South Judah in the Jerusalem Temple. Then, Passover was kept by King Josiah of South Judah in the Jerusalem Temple. Later, Passover was kept once the people returned from Babylon after the 70 years of captivity. The last Passover was kept by Jesus and his disciples. Second point, 
As Jesus started his public life, he prayed in the desert. And as he prepared to take the cross, he prayed at Gethsemane. After observing the last Passover with his disciples, Jesus headed towards Gethsemane to pray. When reading through the four Gospels, we can learn how busy Jesus was throughout his three-year public life. However, no matter how busy he was, Jesus always made time for prayer. To look at just the four instances when Jesus prayed, the first was before starting his public life when he prayed for 40 days in the desert. The second was before selecting his disciples. The third was after washing the feet of his disciples when he prayed for each of them. The fourth was the day before taking the cross and he prayed most sincerely to God. Jesus expressed the state of his mind to his disciples and he asked God to take away this cup of suffering if he could. We must also learn to pray like Jesus, to ask for God's will first, rather than asking for what we want. Third point, the Sanhedrin assembly paid out an enormous sum of money to make Jesus take the cross. After praying in Gethsemane, Jesus was arrested by the Sanhedrin assembly. During this process, Judas Iscariot came. Peter sliced off one of the man's ear, and a young man had to flee because he had followed Jesus. Jesus' arrest was so fearful that all his disciples ran away. Even the brave Peter denied Jesus three times. All throughout the night, Jesus was questioned and mocked for being a blasphemer. At dawn, he was taken to Pontius Pilate to receive another trial. Pilate knew exactly why Jesus was sent to him. This was because the Sanhedrin assembly was jealous of him. Thus, Pilate tried to free Jesus by using his Passover card. However, the Sanhedrin assembly had already considered this and had a backup plan. They hired some Jews to raise their voice to crucify Jesus, and then added false accusations against him. They used a lot of money to make this all happen. Thus, they used the Passover to kill Jesus, and the Sanhedrin assembly dreamed of living in peace once this was all over. To list the money they used, first, there was the 30 pieces of silver they gave to Judas Iscariot. Second, they hired the people to arrest Jesus. Third, they paid some Jews to make false accusations about him. Fourth, they bribed Herod and Pilate to get what they wanted. Fifth, they paid the crowd to shout out to crucify Jesus. Sixth, they paid a great deal of money to the soldiers who saw Jesus' resurrection. And seventh, they spray the money in the build up to killing Jesus. All this money was from the offerings made by the Jews and the diaspora Jews. After this instance, they planned to get rich again with the offerings of the Jews during the next religious festival. Even after Jesus shouted, it is finished, and the curtain of the temple ripped in two, they went at Pilate to sew up the curtain in order to pretend as though nothing had happened. Fourth point, the poor Joseph helped during the birth of Jesus, and then the rich Joseph helped after Jesus' death. In Mark's Gospel, a man named Simon is recorded with regard to the instant of Jesus' cross. Mark also closely recorded Golgotha. Golgotha meant the price of a skull, and here, Many dead bodies were thrown away. Here Jesus died on the cross. Luke recorded how a captain of a hundred glorified God. The funeral for Jesus was carried out by Joseph of Arimathea. Joseph was a member of the Sanhedrin assembly, but he was a righteous man who waited for the kingdom of God. The people around Jesus, after he died, had no power to give him a funeral. Here, Joseph of Arimathea stood up and asked the Roman governor for his body. 
The reason he was able to meet the governor was because he was a member of the Sanhedrin assembly. When Jesus was born, he received the help from Joseph and Mary. After the cross, he received the help of Joseph of Arimathea. Indeed, they were wonderful people who served Jesus well. Fifth point. The resurrected Jesus came to his disciples and told them about his second coming. Jesus appeared before the people numerous times after the resurrection. He met with Mary Magdalene, who served Jesus most sincerely. She was with Jesus during the whole process of his crucifixion, and she was also one of the first to see Jesus after the resurrection. Jesus also met with his two disciples. Although they had heard of Jesus' resurrection, they did not believe. John's Gospel records how Thomas put his hands on Jesus' wounds to check that it was Jesus. Jesus also met with his 11 disciples when they were eating. He met with them and rebuked them for their little faith. After seeing the resurrected Jesus, the disciples were instructed to spread Jesus' good news. Spreading the news about Jesus is our great commission. Day 296, Nook 1 to 2. Passover at 12 years old. Two women who loved God, Elizabeth and Mary, were important to us, through which the most important event in the history of humankind was opened. First point Elizabeth and Mary, who loved God, dearly obeyed God in doing the most beautiful thing for humanity. As a true historian, Luke's gospel was thorough with detailed background information. At the time, many people recorded the gospel of Jesus Christ. As for Luke, he recorded Jesus' gospel in order to hand over to most excellent Theophilus. Luke started with the birth of John the Baptist. This began with the story of Elizabeth and Mary, who both obeyed God. Elizabeth was an old woman who was also barren. However, God granted her pregnancy. God's angel also went to Mary to inform her that she was to give birth to Jesus Christ. All this was pre-told in the Bible as far back as the prophet Nathan. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. The angel told the Virgin Mary that she would conceive and also told her about Elizabeth. The angel furthermore told Mary that there was nothing that the Lord could not do. After hearing this, Mary obeyed. Some time later, Mary and Elizabeth, who were cousins, met. Elizabeth blessed Mary and also called her the mother of her Lord to acknowledge and praise Jesus. Through Elizabeth, Mary once again praised God. In Luke chapters 1 and 2, many praises and worship are recorded. In chapter 1, Mary's song as well as Zachariah's song is recorded, and in chapter 2, the song of the angels and Simeon's song is recorded. Thus, Luke's gospel could be seen as a praise book. Mary's praise, in particular, reminds us of Hannah's praise in the Old Testament. Second point, John the Baptist, who was the son of a priest, lived not in the temple but in the desert. The story of Jesus' birth starts with the birth of John the Baptist. The Lord's angel appeared before Zechariah. Zechariah was a priest and he was working according to his duties. When God's angel appeared before him, the working shift of the priest was decided according to the casting lot method. And this was decided back in the days of Moses, when the angel told Zechariah that his wife Elizabeth would conceive. Zechariah declared that their prayers had been answered. Thus, John the Baptist was born from the prayers of his parents and was prepared by God. 
the directions God gave to his angel to deliver remind us of the laws of dedicating a large light. John the Baptist was the Elijah spoken by the prophet Malachi. The angel told Zechariah that John was to prepare for the birth of Jesus, whom God would send 400 years after the days of Malachi. However, Zechariah did not immediately believe this. Because of his doubt, Zechariah was muted, but this was more in order to give Zechariah faith. In due course, Elizabeth gave birth to a baby. The baby was circumcised on the eighth day, and his name was John, as was instructed by the angel. When news about John spread, all of Judea was curious about John. Zechariah praised God for helping him to remember his covenant with Abraham. Zechariah continued to praise God for the salvation Jesus Christ would bring. John the Baptist was sent to this world to prepare for the way of Jesus. Before Jesus came, John the Baptist ministered not in the temple but in the desert. Third point, the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem was predicted 800 years ago by the prophet Micah, which unraveled with the Roman emperor's command. Luke chapter 2 records the birth of Jesus. At the time, due to the commands of the Roman Empire to take a census, Jesus was born in Bethlehem as opposed to Nazareth. However, we remember that the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem was predicted in the Old Testament by the prophet Micah. Mary had to travel all the way to Bethlehem despite being days away from giving birth. And this was due to the words of Micah and also the regulations of the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire at the time was interested in taking census in order to collect the exact amount of tax, especially from their conquered nations. Seen from the bigger picture, Jesus was born in Bethlehem in order to fulfill the words of Micah. The shepherds of Bethlehem were invited to praise Jesus. During the night, the angel of the Lord appeared before them to tell them this news. Being shepherds, they led very difficult lives, but God blessed them with this great news. They went to see Jesus and praised him. Fourth point, when Jesus came to this world, the Magi presented him with gifts. The Bethlehem shepherds praised him and Simeon offered a prayer of thanks to God. Jesus, who was born in Bethlehem, was circumcised according to the regulations of a kingdom of priests. After this, he was named Jesus as directed by God's angel. When the time came, Joseph and Mary headed towards the Jerusalem temple with Jesus in order to dedicate him to God. As such, Jesus was circumcised, dedicated, and Mary and Joseph glorified God. Afterwards, Simeon's praise had its foundation in Isaiah's record from 800 years ago. Following on from Simeon, Prophet Anna also met Jesus. Anna also confessed that Jesus was the Messiah. Fifth point. Luke records that Jesus observed the Passover with his family all during his youth. Luke recorded Jesus' youth. Matthew also recorded the story of Joseph and Mary, as well as the instance of Jesus having to flee to Egypt and then coming back to Judea before going to Nazareth. During this time, Jesus kept Passover with Mary and Joseph in the Jerusalem temple. Jesus listened to the teachers in the temple as well as questioning them. Jesus debated with them according to the rules of the Jews. All the people who heard Jesus' questions were amazed. Luke recorded that Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Day 297, Luke 3-4 hand this on each person.
after Jesus was baptized, he fasted in the wilderness for 40 days and prepared his ministry of salvation for humankind by overcoming the temptation of Satan. First point, Luke introduced John the Baptist like a true historian. All four Gospels recorded the story of John the Baptist. Luke recorded John like a true historian. Luke described those who were ruling the land of Judea under the rule of the Roman Empire at the time. During the times of John the Baptist, the rulers were as follows. First, the emperor was Tiberius, who was the second emperor following from Augustus Caesar. Second, Pontius Pilate was the governor. Third, Herod was Tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, Tetrarch of Ituria and Traconitis, and Lysanias, Tetrarch of Avelin. Fourth, the high priests of the temple were Annas and Caiaphas, the son-in-law of Annas. John the Baptist was the last prophet ever to be after the 400-year silence since prophet Malachi. During this time, the people received the baptism from John and asked him what they were to do. John told them to repent and also to give their robes to someone else if they owned to, to share food with others, for tax collectors to not over-collect tax, and soldiers to not make false accusations. As such, John prepared for the way of the Messiah. Jesus came to John to be baptized by him. Second point, Luke, who was a Greek historian, recorded Jesus' genealogy after thoroughly studying the history of Israel. Luke, the historian, thoroughly studied the records in Chronicles before recording Jesus' genealogy. Luke's genealogy is slightly different to that of Matthew's. Matthew records Jesus starting from Abraham and emphasized that Jesus was the Messiah, as predicted in the Old Testament. As for Luke, he went from Jesus, Joseph, David, Abraham, Noah, Adam, and then God. In other words, Luke went all the way to God, the Creator, in recording Jesus. Matthew wrote for the Jews, and Luke wrote in order to reveal that Jesus was the Messiah of the world. Thus, Luke's record traced all the way back to Adam in order to stress that all humans needed the salvation of Jesus Christ. Luke, as such, thoroughly studied the records in Chronicles in order to record the most accurate genealogy of Jesus Christ. Third point, God tested people to see their hearts and then granted them with greater love. Before starting his public life, Jesus went to the desert and fasted for 40 days as he prayed. It was after this that Satan came to test Jesus. Luke tells this that Jesus defeated Satan and that was that. The reason God tested his people in the Bible was in order to grant them more love and blessing. To look into three cases of tests God gave, First was Abraham. We all know that Abraham passed with flying colors. The second was the manna generation. Moses told them that God did not always send them manna, and this was in order to test them. The third was Job. Job who passed Satan's test brought joy to God. As such, God at times tests his people in order to grant them bigger blessings. First point, Luke recorded that Jesus' teaching began with the Spirit of God and was predicted by the prophet Isaiah. To summarize Jesus' public life, he healed, taught, fed, prayed, and forgave sinners. Luke started Jesus' teaching in the synagogue of Galilee. The synagogue was used after the Jerusalem temple was burned down by the Babylonian soldiers and was used during the years leading up to building the temple. The synagogue then became the core of the Jewish society throughout the Persian, Hellenistic, 
and Roman empires. Everywhere the Jews lived, they established a synagogue to be used for worship, education, and also legal purposes. Jesus taught a great deal in the synagogues, and later, St. Paul also used them for the purpose of spreading the gospel. Luke records the time Jesus read the Bible in the synagogue in Nazareth during his youth. It appears that Jesus requested for the Bible to be read during worship. Jesus read the book of Isaiah, and this was in the power of the Spirit. The part Jesus found was Isaiah chapter 61. As such, Jesus started his teaching with what was written in the Old Testament. Fifth point, until sunset at Capernaum, Jesus spent all his time healing the sick with his hands. After Jesus started his public life, he read the scriptures of Isaiah in the Nazareth synagogue. But there was also an instant whereby he was excluded from Nazareth. Jesus referred to the passages associated with Elijah and Elisha. Firstly, during the three and a half years into the famine, Elijah was not welcomed into Israel and therefore went to a foreign land where he was welcomed by a widow. Second, there were many patients with leprosy during the days of Elisha, but the only one to be healed was a foreign person. When Jesus taught this, he was excluded from Nazareth. The people were not interested in hearing about Jesus' opinions and therefore excluded him. Jesus then went to Capernaum to teach, and while there, he also warded off demons. Jesus spent all the hours up to sunrise healing patients with his own hands. Day 298 Luke 5 to 6 Discipline and Working Together Jesus selected those who confessed themselves as sinners and made them his disciples, and they received intense training from Jesus. First point, David, who was a shepherd, was called as king, and Peter, who was a fisherman, was called as an apostle. Before starting his public life, Jesus selected his twelve disciples who were to be with him. Peter was the first to be called, and the next was Andrew, James, and John. When Jesus met Peter, Peter had been fishing all night but was unable to catch anything. Jesus told him to throw the net again. Despite how Peter was a pro fisherman, he obeyed Jesus' command and threw the net again. This was the first time Peter experienced Jesus' miracle. Peter was so surprised by this miracle and immediately confessed to Jesus that he was a sinner. With this, Peter and Andrew James and John joined Jesus first. The mission that Jesus gave to Peter was to not be afraid, as he would gather people later. In other words, he would be a fisher of people. As such, Jesus did not look for or gather the well-educated elites, but rather selected fishermen like Peter as his disciple. By the sentence that Peter threw the net all during the night, we can learn that he repeatedly tried hard to catch some fish. Jesus regarded his efforts highly and also regarded Peter's obedience highly. Someone that reminds us of Peter is David, as Peter continuously tried to catch fish all during the night. David also tried his best to protect his father's sheep, which ultimately meant that he was able to defeat Goliath using his practiced and perfected skills. Peter, with his fisherman hands, later wrote one and two Peter. God raised the shepherd David to become the king of Israel, and the fisherman Peter as Jesus' representative apostle. Second point, 
Matthew offered his house to hold a feast on behalf of Jesus, as well as for other tax collectors and the sinners. Jesus healed the man with leprosy. Jesus told him to show his body to the priest, according to the laws of a kingdom of priests, and then returned to living in society. Luke thoroughly recorded Jesus' healing ministry, including the time he healed a paralyzed man. When the crowds gathered extensively, one sick person who was lifted down from the ceiling by his friends was healed on behalf of their faith. Jesus furthermore forgave his sins. As such, Jesus had great mercy in his heart. Jesus called for more disciples. After calling the fisherman, he then called the tax collector. Luke emphasized that Jesus came not only for the Jews, but in order to save the whole world. To the fisherman who confessed that he was a sinner, he made him his disciple. And he also made a tax collector who was severely frowned upon during the time into his disciple. When Matthew the tax collector was called as Jesus' disciple, he was so pleased that he held a feast. He knew why Jesus had come to this world. He opened up his house and invited many sinners and tax collectors, and they were all able to meet Jesus. Matthew's actions were the polar opposite to that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who criticized Jesus for eating with the sinners. To this, Jesus replied that he came to the world for the sinners, just as a doctor exists for the patient. Jesus revealed that he came to forgive the sinners. Third point, the Pharisees who were financially stable did not understand the behavior of the hungry. Luke chapter 6 opens with the Pharisees criticizing Jesus. Jesus' reply can be seen in Luke 6, verses 3 to 5. To the Pharisees who rebuked Jesus' disciples for walking to eat on Sabbath, Jesus used the example of David to back up their actions. Jesus reminded them that the most important reason for Sabbath was to protect and take care of the poor and weak for them to rest people and fed many hungry people during Sabbath. As such, Jesus helped many poor and weak people to meet with God during Sabbath. Jesus emphasized that the Lord of the Sabbath was himself. The Pharisees, who were financially stable, could not relate to the hungry people or Jesus' disciples and merely leave to them for not keeping the law. Fourth point, Luke records that Jesus prayed all night long before calling his disciples. After calling Peter, Andrew, James, John, and Matthew, Jesus then called the last of his disciples. Luke recorded that Jesus prayed all throughout the night before selecting his disciples. More so than other books of the Gospel, Luke recorded Jesus' prayers. Luke chapter 3, verse 21, chapter 5, verse 16, chapter 9, verse 18, chapter 9, verse 28, chapter 11, verse 1, and chapter 22, verse 44. Fifth point, Luke recorded both blessing and curses and lot that blessings would occur on earth as in heaven. Luke 6 verses 20 to 49 records Jesus' teachings in the mountains as well as his teachings on land. As for Matthew, he recorded Jesus' teachings all in chapter 5 through to 7. But as for Luke, he only recorded a portion in chapter 6 and then scattered them throughout the chapters 11 to 16. To look at Jesus' teachings recorded in Luke chapter 6, first, the emphasis was on those who were blessed. Jesus here referred to those who were poor, hungry, and sadness and were being rebuked. The second emphasis was woe to you, and here he referred to the wealthy 
the happy, the ones who were praised, etc. The third emphasis was on loving your enemy. The fourth emphasis was on not rebuking others. The fifth was on recognizing a good tree. The sixth was on building a house on the rock. Day 299, Luke 7 to 8, The Amazing Centurion. Since the mind of the poor, tax collectors, and sinners who approached Jesus was like good soil, they heard the word of Jesus and kept bearing fruits. First point Luke recorded the faith of two centurions in both Luke's Gospel and Acts. The story of Jesus healing the centurion's servant is recorded in the full Gospels. Matthew recorded that Jesus praised the centurion for his big faith. But Luke recorded this instant in further detail. Luke wrote that this instant occurred with the help of the elders of Judea. Although this centurion worked for the Roman Empire, he was generous towards the Jews and moreover built them a synagogue. Therefore, when the Jews heard that the centurion's servant was ill, they wished to express their gratitude to the centurion by sincerely asking Jesus to heal him. As such, Luke studied into the historical background of this story and recorded this instant thoroughly. We do not know the name of this centurion, but Jesus said that he had the biggest faith. He would have been like Cornelius, who appears in Acts. Luke recorded both the book of Luke and Acts, and they were both written for Theophilus. Luke would have wished for Theophilus, along with the two centurions, to witness the gospel throughout the Roman Empire as well as to the foreign nations. Second point, Jesus had pity on the widow who lost her son and so raised him from the dead. The story of Jesus saving the widow's son is only recorded in Luke's Gospel. The reason Jesus saved him was because he pitied the widow. After saving her son, Jesus then saved a man's daughter. Jesus also saved Lazarus from death. Luke recorded that Jesus saved the widow's son as well as the instance of the disciples of John the Baptist confirming that Jesus was the Messiah. Luke also recorded how Jesus praised John the Baptist to his disciples. Third point, Jesus used a parable to change the mind of Simon the Pharisee. One day, Jesus was invited to a Pharisee's house for a meal. Here, a woman poured a luxurious perfume over Jesus' head. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Although this Pharisee perceived Jesus to be a prophet, when he saw that Jesus was with the woman, he treated Jesus also like a sinner. Jesus knew exactly what he was thinking, and then taught him through a parable. Jesus taught him that everyone was a sinner. At the time, it was customary for the host to wash the feet of his guests, kiss him and pour perfume over their heads. The Pharisee who had invited Jesus clearly was not well-mannered. A woman who was not even invited showed more manner and respect. Jesus compared the Pharisee to the woman, whereas the Pharisee did not even wash Jesus' feet, the woman washed Jesus' feet with her tears and wiped it with her hair. The Pharisee did not kiss Jesus, but the woman kissed his feet. The Pharisee did not pour perfume over his head, but the woman poured it all over Jesus' head. Jesus said this and forgave the woman's sins. Fourth point, Luke recorded that those who followed Jesus did so 
kept selling their property in order for service. During his public life, Jesus was extremely busy as he dedicated himself to his five-type ministry of feeding, healing, teaching, forgiving, and praying. All of Jesus' disciples were with him during this time, and there were also women who followed. Luke recorded the acts of Jesus' disciples. Luke also recorded the women who helped and followed Jesus. Jesus healed the demon-possessed as well as the sick. Thus, the women wanted to help Jesus' ministry and therefore sold their property in order to financially help. These women were with Jesus until the end when Jesus suffered on the cross and eventually became the witnesses of resurrection. Fifth point, Jesus thought that anyone who listened and acted after hearing God's laws became family in God's kingdom. But the seed on good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart who hear the word, retain it, and by persevering produce a crop. The Jews waited for the Messiah to come for a long time. Thus, it was absolutely normal that Jesus was welcomed with open arms. However, when the Jews saw Jesus, they did not welcome him, and they did not want to go near him. Therefore, Jesus went around with the poor, the women, the tax collectors, and the sinners, whom no one wanted to have in their community. However, these people were able to produce good fruits by listening to Jesus. Jesus taught them about the blessings in the kingdom of God. Jesus used all sorts of parables to help them understand. Jesus explained that there were, of course, those people who would not listen. Jesus continued to explain about the family within the kingdom of God. They were those who listened to God's words and acted on it. Day 300 Luke 9 to 10. The ability and power to heal the sick. Jesus said that faith should move forward as far as to practice his service and showed himself as a model of becoming a good neighbor to the weak. First point. Luke revealed the conversation Jesus had with Moses and Elijah on Mount Tabor. Luke chapter 9 records the story of how Jesus sent out his disciples to spread the message, the miracle of multiplying the bread and fish, Peter's confession, and Jesus' predictions about his suffering and resurrection. Luke also records the instant of Jesus' transfiguration and how he spoke to Moses and Elijah. Jesus had a conversation with Moses and Elijah in the mountains, and this was about his death. Luke also recorded the glory of Jesus Christ. As God had already declared, this was the Jesus predicted both in Psalms and also in Isaiah. A voice from heaven came down three times to glorify Jesus. The first was after Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist. The second was during Jesus' transfiguration. The third was before Jesus' public life ended and before his suffering. As such, during Jesus' ministry, God spoke from heaven. During Jesus' conversation with Moses and Elijah, Peter offered to make them a shelter. The disciples wished to stay up in the mountain for longer, but Jesus declined their request and went back down the mountain to join the people. Second point, God's mercy towards Samaria for the past 800 years was expressed through Jesus' actions towards Samaritan people. After Jesus' transfiguration, Jesus came back down from the mountains and continued to heal the people who were sick and demon-possessed. Jesus predicted his suffering for the second time to his disciples. Following this, the disciples started to argue among them as to which of them would be the greatest. Jesus took a child and then said that 
whoever welcomes this child in Jesus' name welcomes him and furthermore told them that the one who was the least among them was the greatest. Next, we come to the story of Jesus restoring Samaria, which had been the capital of North Israel. With the fall of North Israel, they had become a mixed race nation. With their race becoming mixed, their religion was also mixed. Because of this, for the past 800 years, they were excluded by the Jews and treated very badly. However, Jesus expressed love and mercy towards them. And this had been predicted by the prophet Hosea, even before the fall of North Israel. The Samaritans knew that Jesus was headed towards Jerusalem and so excluded Jesus all the more. Here, James and John told Jesus that they hoped that Samaria would be punished. When Jesus heard this, he rebuked them. Jesus later praised the Samaritan for returning to thank Jesus after being killed from leprosy. St. John Wright wrote that after the conversation between Jesus and the Samaritan woman, the gospel spread in Samaria. Jesus restored Samaria fully through his great commission. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Third point, Jesus taught his disciples that their priority should be in the kingdom of God. One day, a man came up to Jesus and said that he would follow Jesus anywhere. To him, Jesus explained the life of his disciples. Jesus explained how difficult and tedious it was to be his disciple. To the man who said that he would follow Jesus after his father's funeral, Jesus told him to follow immediately. In other words, Jesus explained that in order to become Jesus' disciple, their priority had to be on God's kingdom, even more so than their parents' funeral. Fourth point, as 70 elders were set up during Moses' time, 70 disciples were raised and sent out to spread the gospel by Jesus. After sending out his disciples, Jesus also gathered 70 people and paired them to spread the gospel. Jesus selected 70, similar to when Moses selected 70 elders from the community. Jesus declared his teachings for many crowds, and this was sometimes to 70, to 12, and to 3. This was not a form of favoritism, but a way of dividing up his teaching. Jesus said that sending off his disciples was like sending young sheep to wolves. Jesus then taught them the following, to not take an extra pair of purse or sandals, to not greet anyone on the road, to wish them peace in their house, to accept their wages, to stay in one house, to heal the sick, and to tell anyone who is there that the kingdom of God was near. After these people returned from their journeys, they reported back to Jesus. Jesus replied to them by referring to the word of the prophet Isaiah. Jesus taught them that their greatest joy should be the thought of their names being written in heaven. Everything else in their lives was to be filled through Jesus. After all this, Jesus prayed to God to thank him. Jesus then outlined the privileges of his disciples. Although the prophets in the Old Testament wished to see the Messiah, they were unable to. However, Jesus' disciples were able to see him and to learn directly from him, which was indeed the greatest privilege. Fifth point, to the teacher of the law who asked who his neighbor was, Jesus used the parable of the man who was robbed and asked who his neighbor was. One day, a teacher of the law came to Jesus to test him. This teacher had quite the knowledge and the laws. He was able to distinguish the 613 laws and categorize them into two types. However, what was wrong with him was that he wished to use his knowledge to show Jesus that he was righteous.
Jesus therefore taught him through the parable of the Good Samaritan. In Jesus' parable, the priest and the Levites had neglected the man who had been loved. However, the Samaritan pitied him and made sure that he was well taken care of by spending his own money. Jesus then asked the teacher again who this man's neighbor was. And then Jesus taught him to go and do likewise. Day 301, Luke 11 to 13. The right attitude during prayer. God opened the door of salvation through the channel of Jesus to all people, including the poor, the rich, male, female, young, and old. First point. Jesus taught how to pray and also taught what the right attitude was for prayer. One day, one of Jesus' disciples asked him an important question. This was how he was to pray to God. He wanted to know what prayer God would be happy to receive. Thanks to this question, the Lord's prayer was liquidated. When Jesus heard this question, he taught him and the last of his disciples how to pray. Jesus stressed that the person praying was to praise God and to first seek his kingdom and then follow up with their own hopes, daily bread, and forgiveness of sin, and to not be tempted. Jesus also taught them to be earnest throughout prayer. Jesus emphasized seeking, finding, and knocking. Jesus, who taught everything through parables, also taught about how God listens to prayer through a parable so that anyone was able to understand. Second point, Luke recorded that Jesus stated three reasons for rebuking the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. In Luke chapter 11, Luke recorded Jesus' prayer that he taught his disciples and then how the people had a lot to say after Jesus warded off the demon trapped inside a person. People had their theories as to how Jesus warded off the demon. But Jesus declared that it was done through God's mighty hands. Some people asked to see a sign from Jesus, but Jesus told them that they were only to see the signs shown to the people of Nineveh during Jonas' time. Next, Jesus rebuked the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. Jesus rebuked the Pharisees based on three points. The first was that although they practiced God's laws in theory, they did not actually have love towards God. The second was that they enjoyed prestige and were full of arrogance. The third was that they were hypocritical. Following on, Jesus rebuked the teachers of the law also based on three points. The first was that they taught others what the law was when they did not properly implement it themselves. The second was that they supported their ancestors, despite how they were the ones who killed God's prophets. The third was that they tried to stop others from receiving salvation. The teachers of the law were those who taught God's laws and then interpreted what it meant. However, they were abusing their status and power. They misused their knowledge and gave wrong interpretations. Both the Pharisees and the teachers of the law heard Jesus' rebuke but did not repent. Rather, they looked for an opportunity to kill Jesus. When Jesus taught about the kingdom of God, he referred to two types of people. The first were the educated people, and to them, Jesus rebuked by saying, You have read, but referring to the laws and the prophets. The second were those who were uneducated about the law, and to them, Jesus said, You have heard, but. Third point, through the parable of a rich person, Jesus taught where we were to place our priorities.
In Luke chapter 12, Jesus warned his disciples against the Pharisees who were hypocrites and how the disciples were to keep their faith strong so that God would protect them on the final day. Jesus moreover told them that the Sanhedrin assembly would come to make their lives difficult, but they were not to worry as the Holy Spirit was to guide them and be with them. During the time Jesus was teaching his disciples, someone came to Jesus and asked him how his family should divide their wealth among them. To him, Jesus used a parable of a wealthy man and taught him through this, where he was to price his priorities in life. The conclusion to this parable was the following. But God said to him, You fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be, with whoever stores up things for themselves but is not rich toward God. Fourth point, Jesus taught what attitude Christians should have when preparing for the final moment. Jesus taught his disciples about what attitude they were to have as Christians as they prepared for the final moment. Jesus gave them two parables to help them understand. The first was the parable of the ravens. The second was the parable of the wild flowers. To the Christians who were preparing for the final moment, Jesus gave them the following teachings. The first was to seek God's kingdom. This was as God knows everything we need. The second was to sell their goods to provide aid. Jesus taught them to let go of worldly obsessions and seek the kingdom of God. The third was to be alert and awake as they waited. The fourth was to be prepared for debates and divisions. The fifth was to distinguish the generations. The sixth was to repent before the final day of judgment. Fifth point, there would come a day that the door of eternal salvation would close. In Luke chapter 13, Jesus spoke about how Pilate killed the people of Galilee and how 18 people died when the Tower of Siloam fell on them, and then taught that they would be severely judged if they did not repent. Jesus then used the parable of the fig tree and then healed the woman who had been sick for the past 18 years on Sabbath. Jesus then used more parables to explain the kingdom of God. When a person asked him about salvation, Jesus taught him how one was to enter the kingdom of God, and furthermore explained that not everyone was able to receive God's salvation. Jesus taught that Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the prophet, and the foreigners who obeyed God were in the kingdom of God. Those who were excluded from the kingdom of God were those who did not obey or have faith in God. Now Jesus went ahead and predicted his death and the fall of Jerusalem. The reason the Pharisees gave information about Herod to Jesus was not because they were concerned for Jesus, but to make him afraid. However, Jesus declared that Herod would not be the reason for his death, but he would die in order to fulfill what was written in the Old Testament, and then he would resurrect again. Jesus then predicted the fall of Jerusalem and lamented. Day 302, Luke 14 to 16. Pharisees and their love for money. The heart of Jesus who came to find the sinners was like the mind of a shepherd who wandered looking for a lost sheep. First point, during Jesus' time, the Pharisees opened up their house for parties as a show of self-righteousness. During Jesus' time, Judea was governed by the Roman Empire. Thus, many Jews suffered from heavy tax. Although the majority of Jews suffered financially during this time, there was a group of people 
who thrived financially despite all this, and they were the Sadducees who controlled the finances of the Jerusalem Temple. The Sadducees lived financially prestigious lives, living off the income from the Jerusalem Temple, and the Pharisees, although not as prestigious, still lived comfortably. They had no guilt that they lived well whilst the Jews lived poor, and they believed that their financial prestige was given to them by God. During this time, the Pharisees held many parties and feasts in their houses. Since superficially, it appeared that they were generous, but deep down, they only invited those who had the ability to pay them or invite them back. However, they used this to proclaim themselves as self-righteous. Here, the third debate about the Sabbath occurred. Jesus first asked the teachers of the law and the Pharisees about the healing the sick during Sabbath. When they could not answer, Jesus healed the sick and said the following, If one of you has a child or an ox that falls into a well on the Sabbath day, Will you not immediately pull it out? During this party, Jesus gave two teachings. The first was to sit in the lowest seat. The second was to provide feasts for those who were not able to repay. Therefore, Jesus taught that in order to be blessed by God, they were not to follow in the ways of the Pharisees, but rather provide aid to those who truly need it. Jesus then followed up with the parables of the feast to explain the kingdom of God. Jesus tried to correct their way of thinking that the Jews were not selected by God for prestige but for mission. Second point, Jesus used a parable to explain the preparations needed to become his disciple. Jesus taught what it took to become his disciple. This was none other than to take their cross. Jesus, who taught all things through parables, used another parable to explain the cost of being a disciple. The first was the parable of the one who built a tower. In other words, a disciple was to not give up and keep going with his role. The second was the parable of the king about to go to war. As a king who was preparing for war, would only go with confidence to win. A disciple also had to prepare with the confidence to win. The third was the parable of the salt that has lost its saltiness. A disciple was like salt. If he lost his discipleship, he would not be able to carry out his task. Third point, Jesus explained the heart of God in wanting to find his lost sheep through three parables. All the details of Jesus' healing ministry spread around the whole of Judea, and this led the religious leaders to spy on Jesus. The Sanhedrin assembly tried hard to test Jesus and to trap him by sending their best debaters. One day, some tax collectors and sinners who were excluded from the Jewish community came to Jesus and seeing this, the Pharisees and teachers of the law rebuked Jesus. Jesus then used the parables to explain God's heart in wanting to find his lost sheep. The first was the parable of the shepherd who had lost his sheep. Jesus explained that one sinner's repentance was the joy in all of the kingdom of God. The second was the parable of a woman who found her lost drachma. The third was the parable of the father who found his lost son. First point, Jesus taught that a person could not serve both God and money. Jesus pitied those who lived in financial hardship and lived under the Sanhedrin assembly's hypocrisy. Jesus taught using the parable of the shrewd manager, a manager of a wealthy man was fired. In order to save himself, the manager called in each one of his master's debtors and then asked each of them how much they owed his master. When the master saw that 
His manager took such measures he praised him. As such, even a manager that was not acknowledged by his master did his best to prepare for his future. What Jesus tried to teach through this parable was that just as this manager used his master's position to prepare for his own future, the disciples were also to wisely use the possessions of this world for the kingdom of God. The conclusion to Jesus' parable was that one was unable to wholeheartedly serve both God and money. Fifth point, Pharisees were those who served both God and money. When the Pharisees heard Jesus' teaching that one could not serve both God and money, they laughed. This was because they believed that their wealth had been given to them by God as their blessing. Although Jesus tried to correct their way of thinking through the parable of the shrewd manager, it was simply inevitable that they loved money more than the kingdom of God. Jesus then rebuked the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, that they were only fixed on the words of the laws rather than their meanings. Jesus furthermore told them to accept that Jesus was sent to fulfill the laws and the prophets. Jesus then spoke about the issue of divorce to the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. The Pharisees replied to the words in Deuteronomy chapter 24 to ask Jesus a trick question about divorce. Therefore, Jesus gave them an answer. Jesus then used the parable of the rich man and Lazarus to teach them about the kingdom of God. When the rich man went to hell and was suffering, he asked for his family to not be brought there. To this, Abraham answered, Those who belonged in heaven were those who believed in Jesus Christ, the Pharisees who did not repent even after listening to Jesus, would soon lament and suffer. We must look to Jesus and hope to be invited to the kingdom of God through Jesus Christ. Day 303, Luke 17 to 18. Jesus, the kingdom of God. The intention of the Pharisees who tried to tempt Jesus foolishly lost their authority against the Son of God. They instead ended up revealing their ignorance. First point. Jesus taught that one should show true loyalty and then confess that they are unworthy servants. Jesus said that in order to become his disciple, they had to become four things. The first was someone who did not cause one of their brothers to stumble. The second was someone who always forgave their brother if he repented. The third was someone who had faith. The fourth was someone who showed true loyalty and then confessed themselves as unworthy servants. After teaching them about the way of the disciple, Jesus healed ten lepers on his way to Jerusalem. In Judea, lepers were regarded as unclean and were unwelcome in society. They had a hope that Jesus would heal them. Jesus healed ten of them, but only one, who was a Samaritan, came back to thank Jesus. That the Samaritan thanked Jesus on his knees was the ultimate expression of his respect and gratefulness. Through this instant, the Samaritans, who had been frowned upon for the past 800 years, became restored to God. Second point. The Pharisees were unable to understand that Jesus came to the world to fulfill God's vision. Through Jesus' ministry, he was already implementing the kingdom of God. When the Samaritan, who was healed from leprosy, thanked Jesus wholeheartedly, that person had already experienced the kingdom of God. However, the Pharisees, who observed Jesus' ministry, were unable to witness or come close to the kingdom of God. This was because they had no intention to believe in the kingdom of God 
and although they had directly asked about it, they refused to see it. The Pharisees wished to rebuke Jesus, who declared that the kingdom of God was there. They did not want to understand that Jesus was the Son of God, who came to save the world. Jesus, nevertheless, continued to teach what would happen to the world when it ended. The following was taught regarding the final day. First, no one knew when this would be. Jesus, however, thought that he would suffer before the final day. Second, those who tried to preserve their lives would lose it, and those who did not would be able to live. Jesus warned them to reflect on Lot's wife on the final day. Third point, Jesus used two parables to teach the people how to pray. Jesus, who taught his disciples how to pray, went into more detail about prayer through two parables. The first parable was about a widow who requested to a judge to help her. Jesus said that even a judge who only wanted to get rid of the widow listened to her, and said that, of course, God listens to our request. The important thing that we must do is to have faith that God would listen. The second was the parable about the Pharisee and the tax collector. The Pharisee's prayer was not a prayer to God, but a public show. Oppositely, the tax collector prayed to God in private and confessed to God that he was a sinner and asked for forgiveness. Jesus said that in this case, the tax collector was more righteous than the Pharisee. Fourth point, the Pharisees, tax collectors, and the sinners had three differences. Jesus justified the identities for the people who belonged in the kingdom of heaven. The people in the kingdom of God were not to be like the teachers of the law or the Pharisees. Jesus taught them exactly what the Pharisees were doing wrong, and this was being self-righteous. They publicly fasted during prayer and also offered tithe. They kept the laws for the people to see. Another thing they did was to rebuke others with their standards. Their actions contained no mercy. For this reason, Jesus referred to them as hypocrites. Oppositely, the tax collectors and the sinners whom Jesus befriended had the following characteristics. The first was that they were embarrassed that they had not kept the laws. The second was that they fully accepted their sins and repented. An example of this is Zacchaeus, who repented and gave away half of his wealth to the poor, and said that he would repay the people he longed by four times. The Samaritan woman who gave Jesus water also confessed her sins and repented, and came to testify Jesus. The third was that they were merciful to others. Fifth point. The Pharisees, who were so focused on causality, were unable to understand God's mercy. The Pharisees lived by the theory of causality. However, the sinners rather relied on God. The Pharisees made others take heavy yokes with their self-righteousness, and they were so caught up in the theory of causality. What they failed to see was that God's mercy existed before his creation. Thus, causality cannot explain God's mercy. Jesus therefore forgave the sinners with God's mercy and taught them that he himself was God's mercy. Day 304, Luke 19 to 20. Trade using minors. Jesus, who looked for not the healthy but the sick, was the one who gave strength to the weak and saved those who were lost. First point, Zacchaeus, who was a tax collector in Jericho, heard about Jesus and wished to meet him. Zacchaeus, who was a tax collector in Jericho, believed that money was best. The most important thing to him was money, 
And so he worked for the Roman Empire to collect a tax from his own people. However, there was a part of him that always felt that something was missing. Around this time, Zacchaeus heard the news of Jesus. He also heard that among his 12 disciples, there was a former tax collector. Zacchaeus, of all people, knew exactly how tax collectors were regarded by the Jews and thus would have been shocked that a tax collector could be chosen as Jesus' disciple. When he heard that Jesus was crossing by Jericho, he wanted to see him, but he was a short man and so climbed a tree to see him. Jesus saw him and told him to come down and then said that he would go into Zacchaeus' house. Throughout the four Gospels, Zacchaeus' house was the only place Jesus said that he would sleep over. This was because Jesus knew very well that Zacchaeus sincerely wished to meet Jesus. Luke recorded the joy of Zacchaeus. However, when the people heard this, they rebuked Jesus for mingling with sinners. Zacchaeus confessed his sin to Jesus and repented. He told Jesus that he would give half of his possession to the poor, and that if he mistreated or fooled anyone, he would pay them back quadruple the amount. When someone stole something, Moses' law stated, they must make a full restitution for the wrong they have done, add a fifth of the value to it, and give it all to the person they have wronged. Zacchaeus gave himself a heavier price for his sins based on this law. Whoever steals an ox or a sheep and slaughters it or sells it must pay back five head of cattle for the ox and four sheep for the sheep. Second point, Jesus used the parable of the minors in order to teach about the kingdom of God. Jesus used the parable of the minors to teach his disciples about the kingdom of God. Luke records how the master called ten of his servants and gave them one minor each. The ten servants were to work hard with this money during the time their master was away. The master came back after his trip and then examined the results. Jesus used this parable in order to teach his disciples how they were to act after Jesus' cross and resurrection. Some would use the minors to fulfill Jesus' will to the best of their abilities. Some would dislike Jesus ascending as the king. Third point, Luke recorded that when Jesus was born, and when he entered Jerusalem, there was peace in heaven and glory on earth. Luke went on to record the final week of Jesus. All the instances of this week occurred within Jerusalem. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, everyone cheered him and praised him. The people praised Jesus and called him the son of David, and referred to a passage in Psalms. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord, we bless you. Luke recorded that when Jesus entered Jerusalem, there was peace in heaven and glory on earth. This was the message that Jesus brought peace to the world and the angels glorified him. When the people praised and cheered Jesus, some Pharisees told Jesus to rebuke his disciples. When Jesus heard their hypocritical advice, he referred to the passage in Habakkuk. Luke recorded that Jesus cried as he entered Jerusalem because of what was to happen soon. Jesus then cleansed the temple from robbers. First point, Luke recorded four debates Jesus had with the religious leaders. Luke chapter 20 recorded Jesus' debate with the members of the Sanhedrin assembly. The first was the debate about authority. The second was about tax. The third was about resurrection. The fourth was about Messiah and the son of David. Fifth point, 
After debating with the religious leaders, Jesus revealed their hypocrisy and warned them. Jesus warned the people against the hypocrisy of the members of the Sanhedrin assembly, who were the most prestigious religious leaders at that time. In Luke chapter 20, Luke recorded again how Jesus warned the people against the hypocritical members of the Sanhedrin assembly. The hypocritical behavior of the Sanhedrin assembly was the following. First, they wished to be respected and wanted to be treated by the people. Second, they looked down on the weak. Third, they prayed to God and fasted in order to show others. Thus, Jesus declared that they would be punished severely for their hypocrisy.